I had the first uh, workshop which focused on G uh, the Green Climate Fund readiness. So this second workshop and second activity focuses on two things. So this first day, we we'll really focus on building on what we had completed in the workshop in July. It would add some additional strengthening to your ability to at least prepare a project proposal, not just for the Green Climate Fund, but also for additional funds. So today you're going to go deep dive into a few low-hanging fruit, what I would call low-hanging fruit funds, um, so that you're able to at least start the process to apply. We also had a key activity um, between July and August, which was the call for project proposals. And I'm happy to say um, that was the first inaugural call for project proposals, and we received 16 very good, compelling project proposals from the Federation. And um, the initial call, initially we were supposed to select two or three to develop a project concept note, but then we decided that um, based on the evaluation criteria, all the projects would be supported. So all the projects would be supported. So congratulations to all, all of you contributors. And for those who didn't really get to do a call for proposals, you're not left out because you'll hear this morning a few additional initiatives from, from the ministry. Um, for additional call for projects, as well as there are some other funds and opportunities out there. I'm happy to also note uh, that I remember in July, um, the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship had announced the Greenpreneurship uh, Program, and a number of participants actually applied, and I understand a few of them have actually progressed to get that 50,000. So I think this project is meeting the mark in terms of raising the awareness and sensitization on what climate finance is, especially how to unlock climate finance for the project for the private sector. Day two is going to take a more strategic overarching approach, which is going to look at how we are going to chart the course create a blueprint for attracting, crowding in uh, climate finance. So on the one hand, we want to be able to scale up the number of projects we're getting out of the private sector and also the public sector uh, in climate action and also in sustainable projects. But at the same time, we also need to find a way of mobilizing more climate finance. So it's very important that this workshop was designed with you in mind and for you. And therefore, we're looking at a more collaborative approach to us preparing this action plan. So we're not just going to have an action plan that sits on a shelf. That action plan is going to be now developed into another uh, program concept note, which we can submit to the Green Climate Fund for additional funding. So this workshop for me is really critical because it has legs. We're not just coming in to learn, acquire skills, and talk. We're actually going to be doing the walk the walk through the Ministry of Sustainable Development. And with that, I would like to invite uh, for a key opening remarks, uh, Mr. Oren Manners, who is the Director of Public Sector Investment Planning within the Ministry of Sustainable Development, which is also the national designated authority, which is the representative of the Green Climate Fund in St. Kitts and Nevis. Welcome, Mr. Manners. Good morning. Uh, good to see everyone here this morning. Um, I'm actually seeing a lot of new faces. Uh, as, as Tilly said, we had a, the last workshop was held in July at, at the Marriott. Um, however, I'm seeing a lot of new faces here. I was just interested to know uh, how many of you 
would have attended the, the workshop in July by a show of hands. Okay. All right, so we, ha we have a lot of uh, returning uh, participants and from the perspective of the ministry, uh, we think that's a good thing because it shows that your level of interest in this initiative is, is being maintained. Uh, when we started out, I think a year ago, uh, we weren't sure of the level of interest, but I think what we've seen recently is, is an increased level of interest in, in this project. Um, also, from the project proposals that were submitted, I, I mean, me personally, I actually um, stood up last night and read each and every one of the, the proposals that you, you submitted, and I think you should give yourselves a round of applause, uh, please, for the, the <coughs> for the quality of the work that was done um, on those proposals. Um, joining us here today, we also have you know, public servants, civil servants. Uh, we have persons here from the department of PSIP, which is um, our department. The, we should be joined by persons from the Ministry of Environment, Climate Action, and Constituency Empowerment. Um, also, the, the, the new Department of Economic Development and Investments, and the Urban Development Unit. And that is important because al although this is private sector focus, we want to make sure that there's a, a cross-pollination of ideas uh, between the public and private sector. Before we go further, I'd like to, there, there are two videos I will share with you this morning. And I would like to ask my colleagues to go ahead and play the first video, please. How do you act for the SDGs? I act for the SDGs by supporting our local market and stocking up on nutrient-rich fruits and vegetables. We act for the SDGs when we clean up after ourselves when liming on the beach to reduce litter on the land and in the sea. I act for the Sustainable Development Goals by recycling natural material from my organic farm to responsibly create nourishing, cruelty-free products. I act for the SDGs by creatively charting my own course as an artist and entrepreneur. I act for the SDGs by partnering to minimize waste and fulfill the No Plastic Mondays promise. I act for the SDGs by exercising regularly to maintain good health and well-being. 
We act for the SDGs by coming together to have a voice so that our issues can be represented in national policy, development and planning. I act for the SDGs by diversifying and expanding education through visual arts inclusion. I act by implementing sustainable agricultural practices such as hydroponics, ground cover, orchard farming and all those things that you've seen outside. I act by turning off all the lights and electronics in my class at the end of the day and educating my students on the importance of energy efficiency. I act by producing a healthy organic harvest to feed communities. We act for the SDGs by making sure to turn off the tap to conserve water when we are washing our hands. I act by cooking healthy meals and being mindful and intentional about the foods I consume. The 17 SDGs are our pathways to transformative sustainability. Let's create the future we want to see by acting now for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, I'm understanding that the internet is not allowing it. I see we have some IT experts here um, <laughs> in the room, but from what I understand, the the internet is not allowing the. the Uh, okay, but we're not ready for the second video yet. Oh. Yeah. All right, but I'll, I'll just explain what this video... Um, uh, it's unfortunate, but the, this is a video that was uh, just put together by the Ministry of Sustainable Development and the Ministry of Environment and, and Climate Action. And what it is, it's going to be an a ongoing campaign uh, so this is just one in uh, uh, several videos that we intend to produce over the next year. Um, we have persons in the room uh, who would have participated in, in the video, uh, in Miss Anastasia uh, Elliott. And so hopefully we will be able to play that for you uh, this morning. Uh, the purpose of the video is to display how, how non-governmental stakeholders um, can contribute to the sustainable development goals. A lot of persons think of the SDGs as the government's responsibility. Um, so this series of videos uh, is geared towards, you know, civil society, the private sector, and persons indicating how they intend to contribute. What, what we would want is, you know, over the course of this project, is to be able to interview some of you, uh, regardless of whether your projects are, you know, well, Telly said all of them were approved, so um, <laughs> we would want to, regardless of whether those projects are active, we'd want to come to you. We also had value mat in the, in the, in the video. Uh, but we would want to come to the private sector and ask the private sector, what are you doing or what do you intend to do to achieve the sustainable development goals, right? So it's not just the, the government. Um, so we've already had one person participate and we hope to have that um, ongoing. Um, if you listen to the, the, the UN General Assembly debates last week, you will realize that the the world is behind in terms of implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, most notably, climate change, or uh, climate action, which is SDG 13. Um, 
we see around the world are several unprecedented, unprecedented events. Uh, we've seen uh, unprecedented uh, flooding in Libya. We've seen uh, you know, wildfires in Hawaii uh, wiping out entire communities. Um, just this week, it was reported that the, the level of ice in the Antarctic is at a record low. And also this week, it was reported that fresh water levels in the Mississippi River in the US are also at record low levels. Um, in St. Kitts and Nevis, we, uh, this year we've had 65% um, of the rainfall that we typically get. And so the impact of climate change is being felt across the world, I I'm sure you would agree. Um, all you have to do is walk outside. Um, by maybe by show of hands, how, how, how many of you um, agree that the the level of heat that we're experiencing this year is um, different than anything we've experienced before? All right, um, and I'm sure you will agree. If this continues, then we're going to have serious problems in terms of productivity uh, in the country. Um, so if, if the temperatures continue in the, the, the way they are, we anticipate that it is going to change the way that we, we live, work, and play in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, everything from how you operate your businesses, um, from how we have recreational activities and outdoor events, um, how children play in schools at, at recess, um, it has implications for cooling our homes, our vehicles, and businesses. And there are costs associated with building resilience of our homes and also and businesses and also responding to natural disasters. So of the SDGs that we want to focus on in these videos, there will be a special emphasis on SDG number 13, which is climate action. In reading your uh, proposals, um, as I said, I stayed up to, to read the proposals. Um, I think the, the quality was um, very high, the level of um, thinking and analysis and innovation that went into those proposals um, is beyond what we've seen even in, in the public sector. And I have been working with uh, project proposals in the public sector for over 17 years. Um, so again, please give yourself a round of applause for that. Um, in reading the proposals, and, and we got proposals ranging from 50,000 US to US $20 million, right? And you would know um, what budget you submitted for your project. Um, but it was clear in, in the proposals that, aside from climate action, that those proposals can assist the government in, in numerous areas. Uh, when we look at SDG 12, sustainable production and consumption, there were proposals that spoke to repurposing organic waste, recycling of plastics, uh, new composting methods, SDG 7, energy. There was a project that look to demonstrate how we can move forward with EV, electrical vehicles. SDG 6, which is one of the most important SDGs for St. Kitts right now, and that is water. There was a very interesting proposal that spoke to how we could capture water from the natural environment. SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. A couple of you submitted projects related to sustainable housing and green villages. SDG 2, zero hunger, and 3, good health and well-being. Proposals focus on nutrition and meeting CARICOM's 25 by 25 agenda. We also had proposals that highlighted education and SDG 17 partnership, and these emphasize skills training, knowledge sharing, and blended financing. And many of the proposals spoke to 
gender equality and improving SDG number two, no poverty. And those proposals, a lot of them spoke to how women will be employed through the, the different initiatives. So telly and global factor, they'll tell you more about the way forward for those proposals. Um, I was also very impressed with the way that the proposals were aligned to the government's priorities. Um, it's obvious that you had to, to incomplete in the template that you had to read the, the government's climate policy, the VNR, the Voluntary National Review, the NDC. Some of you had to read the agricultural strategy. And, you know, it probably took you some late nights, um, probably something you're not accustomed to doing, but we thank you for taking the time to read the government's um, uh, strategies. And regardless of what happens with the proposals, at least you would leave here with additional knowledge. Um, so grant financing should not just be for the government, uh, grant writing. Um, I want to end by highlighting a few other opportunities um, that you can explore, regardless of what happens with this uh, GCF uh, initiative. The Government of Colombia, um, we have to start to look beyond for grant financing, to look beyond the developed partners such as the EU and the US. We have to look to other um, areas such as Latin America. And so the, the Latin American countries for some time have been approaching the government to offer assistance. Um, currently, we have the Government of Colombia who offers assistance in trade, culture, education, sports, agriculture, renewable energy, climate change. And when they offer this assistance, it doesn't mean that it has to stop at the government. And I think because it comes through the government, that is how we take it, that it's for government projects. But what we need to start to explore is how we can have more projects that are joint ventures between the government and the private sector. Um, the OAS, they provide a platform online which is called Corporanet, and that allows any country in the Caribbean to go onto the platform and seek assistance in certain areas. So what you have is, is Latin American countries um, indicating where they are willing to offer assistance and countries indicating where they need assistance. So what it is a matching platform that allows, again, this is through the government, um, allows you to seek assistance from mainly Latin American countries. Um, that assistance, however, is not financial. It's in the form of technical assistance and experts that they're willing to provide to you. Um, the GEO Act call for proposals. Um, Telly, can you pull up number one, please? Okay, so this is a, a call for proposals that we, through the government, that we have been receiving over the past year. Uh, they do successive calls, and uh, it's funded by the European Union, and the beneficiaries are meant to be African, Caribbean, and Pacific states. Um, and this program, it, it offers up to, uh, in the range of Euro, $300,000 to 500000 um, it's currently not open, 
but the, the previous uh, calls for proposals, there has been very limited uptake. And part of the reason for that is because when we get the call for proposals, we would send it to most of the public sector. Um, we may have sent it to the chamber, I, I don't remember, but the, 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 in terms of persons subscribing to this call proposals, it has been very low. Um, so, but the funding is available, and if there's another call for proposals, we'll be sure to circulate it to this group. And this, they offer financing for innovative and sustainable mitigation and ad adaptation solutions to address geological risk and climate change. The government of India, could you pull up number two? So this is um, a call for proposals that is currently open. Um, the government of India is offering $1 million US in machinery and technology to small businesses in Sinkits and Nevis. All right. Um, so we can't keep this one in government. This one is for you, right? A lot of <laughs> these, fr these funding, they come to government and they don't get to the, the necessarily uh, infiltrate the private sector. Um, however, this one is for you. I've already spoken to Kyla at Small Business to see how we can get this information to you. And uh, I think Telly has agreed to do a quick call for proposals to the group. Uh, we have a very strict deadline of about a week. And so we're going to ask you, is there any machinery that you would like to access from India? Um, can you just scroll up? Um, so there are about 10 companies from India. You have to import the equipment from India, which is a benefit to them, of course. Um, there are about 10 companies that describe what type of equipment they offer. If you scroll down, please. This company offers agro-processing plants and equipment. Um, a number of you submitted projects that spoke to agro-processing and uh, production of teas and fruit juices, things of that nature. And so this is an avenue where you can <coughs> directly access support. It may, it may not be the exact equipment that you want, but if you scroll down, please, just go to the... It, they're willing to provide this machinery up to US $1 million. Um, of course, we'd want that to spread across a number of businesses. Uh, you can scroll down, just scroll down. Right, so these are some of the types of juices and so forth that you can manufacture using their equipment. Um, can you go to number three? For those of you who are not into fruit juices, then there are other companies that um, offer different types of equipment, uh, heavy equipment, industrial uh, type equipment, uh, depending on what type of business you're in. Number three. All right, while she pulls up number three, the, the government of India is also offering up to 50,000 US um, for five projects and that's 50,000 US per project. Um, that is not specifically for the private sector. Uh, we would, of course, want to uh, take a stab at that in, from the perspective of the government in terms of suggesting projects, um, but we're more than open to working with the private sector in the submission of five projects up to 50,000 US. Right. Um, while the, the, she pulls up that, the, the government is currently completing its budget process for 2024. You know about the budget estimates. 
and we will be doing national consultations on the budget. Um, there's scope for some of your proposals to be, even if they're not funded by grants, uh, to potentially be pursued as joint ventures between the government and the private sector. Uh, the, I mentioned the water proposal, uh, how you capture water without desalination and drilling. That's something that the water department would probably be interested in. in. A number of you submitted projects that are important for the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, also in housing, urban development, and climate action. And so what we can commit to do um, outside of the grant funding is to, if you're open to it, to share your proposals with the relevant authorities in water and agriculture uh, to see how we can pursue some of these as joint ventures funded by the government. Uh, are you open to that? I don't know. By show of hands. <laughs> No? Okay. Um, but that is another avenue by which we can pursue these projects because as I read the projects, uh, they, they answer a lot of questions that we are trying to answer in government. How do we get more water? Uh, how do we build sustainable housing? Um, how do we establish green villages? How do we get to EV? The, the government has been battling with electric vehicles for a while now. And so if, if the private sector has ideas and, and a way and a skill set to implement those projects. We would want to invite you to uh, sit down with the government uh, with those projects, please. Right, in closing, I just want to mention one more grant funding opportunity, and this is from the, the Prince of Wales, who is now the King of, uh, the, King of the Commonwealth, uh, King Charles. And he started this initiative in 2020. Um, it is a group of over 300 wealthy investors and CSOs in the UK who are looking to invest in, in sustainable projects uh, throughout the Commonwealth region, which includes Sinkits and Nevis. And they approached us about this two years ago during COVID, uh, asked the government, can you show us some projects that are Number one, sustainable. And number two, they must have a return on investment. In other words, they're not looking for public sector projects. Uh, they're looking for commercially driven projects. Uh, projects may be done by businesses that turn a profit and have a return on investment. And so because that was the criteria, yes, the government can propose sustainable projects, but we don't have many projects in the public sector that speak to a return on investment. That, that would be you. And so I'm flagging this opportunity because this again is something that is targeted towards you, the private sector. We have the project template and the criteria. And as I said, there are two criteria. Well, there's about 100 criteria, um, honestly. But the two main criteria, the project has to be sustainable and it has to have a return on investment. And so we'll share that with you. So to wrap up, I would like to share the video from the King of the UK. on this. It's called the Sustainable Markets Initiative. And hopefully we can also play the SDG video. and stocking up on nutrient rich How do you act for the SDGs? I act for the SDGs by supporting our local market and stocking up on nutrient rich fruits and vegetables. 
We act for the SDGs when we clean up after ourselves when liming on the beach to reduce litter on the land and in the sea. I act for the Sustainable Development Goals by recycling natural material from my organic farm to responsibly create nourishing, cruelty-free products. I act for the SDGs by creatively charting my own course as an artist and entrepreneur. I act for the SDGs by partnering to minimize waste and fulfill the No Plastic Mondays promise. I act for the SDGs by exercising regularly to maintain good health and well-being. We act for the SDGs by coming together to have a voice so that our issues can be represented in national policy, development and planning. I act for the SDGs by diversifying and expanding education to visualize inclusion. I act by implementing sustainable agricultural practices such as hydroponics, ground cover, orchard farming and all those things that you've seen outside. I act by turning off all the lights and electronics in my class at the end of the day and educating my students on the importance of energy efficiency. I act by producing a healthy organic harvest to feed communities. We act for the SDGs by making sure to turn off the tap to conserve water when we are washing our hands. I act by cooking healthy meals and being mindful and intentional about the foods I consume. The 17 SDGs are our pathways to transformative sustainability. Let's create the future we want to see by acting now for the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. Okay. All right, just one more video and then we'll hand over to the next um, speaker. And as I said, and I'd like to thank Anastasia Elliott for um, participating in that video. And we hope to um, extend that to the rest of you uh, very shortly. Um, the next video should be produced uh, towards the end of the year. So if any of you are interested, uh, just let Telly you know. Okay, we, we, we'll get, we'll get, in, yes, we'll get to that. Um, right, thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks. You can plan and plan and plan and technology just ends up just changing course. So, apologies, at least we have a backup computer, so. Uh, without further ado, um, I am going to introduce uh, Ms. Kyla gibson Dorr from the Ministry of uh, Small Business and Entrepreneurship and the SBDC to just come and give us a few remarks before we kick off this workshop. Kyla, thank you. Good morning to everyone.
these are just a few uh, brief remarks, nothing to elaborate, right? I am Kyla Gibson Doer. I am the Senior Business Advisor in the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. The Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship is delighted to be part of this initiative as it is our motto to build businesses and fuel innovation. And having funding to drive climate smart project projects do indeed allow businesses to grow and allows for creative innovation. The ministry stands willing to assist businesses in any way possible with our current services of business advising, business plan development, business management training, and import duty waiver. Of course, we continue to facilitate interventions by our local, regional, and international partners, all with the aim of providing networking opportunities, access to different markets, and resources in terms of funding, expert advisors, and equipment. The ministry continues to partner with the Global Green Growth Institute in the aim of building capacity and sustainability for green entrepreneurs through its incubator and accelerator programs and grants. The newest addition to this initiative is institutional capacity building to ensure that once the Global Green Growth Institute uh, leaves our shores that the local BSO, the Ministry of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, has the capacity to support businesses in the green, green businesses. Therefore, the marrying of the Global Green Growth Institute program for green entrepreneurs and this program of uh, climate funding is very important to the ministry because then we would have the support needed to help our small businesses who are in need of this in terms of capacity building and the sourcing of funds for their ideas. So we are very happy for both of these programs. The ministry is very supportive, supportive of the goal of this two-day pro program of building capacity locally in mastering of proposal writing to access climate finance and mobilizing climate financing, which is a plus for our entrepreneurs. Those of you who are here who are learning and those who are not here, as there will be capable persons and institutions to seek assistance when opportunities in the future arise. So with these few short words, I wish you a successful workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gibson Dorr. And I believe the tech has been fixed, so we're going to watch that video before I introduce the Global Factor team. Everything was being designed and started in many ways to battle against nature and to suppress and destroy, exploit. But it may have gone a little bit too far in terms of the exploitation we've imposed on the natural world which I suppose you could get away with for a certain amount of time. Everything was being designed, and still is in many ways, to battle against nature and to suppress and destroy, exploit. But it may have gone a little bit too far in terms of the exploitation we've imposed on the natural world which I suppose you could get away with for a certain amount of time because it wasn't apparent that we were doing lasting damage, as with carbon emissions from all the fossil fuels we burn in every form or other. It took people a long time to recognize that this was causing a huge problem in the atmosphere and warming our whole planet. And still people deny it. Until recently, nobody would have paid the slightest attention. But suddenly, because of the challenges we're now finding hitting us in the face and the huge problems we've created, there's become an interest in these issues. 
I spent a lot of effort over my lifetime trying to bring people around the table with the Sustainable Markets Initiative, bring them together, industry by industry, to focus on how can we more rapidly decarbonize each industry, make the transition necessary, and actually find a much better way of doing things. Everything in nature, it's a finite resource. There's only a certain amount within the planetary boundary that we operate in, and the trouble now is that through this whole approach to partly to convenience, we've forgotten that we have to live within the planetary boundaries. We have to make a real integrated global effort. At the moment, we've so degraded natural systems, ecosystems, biodiversity. Would we see the impacts, but we are really facing an existential risk. So. This workshop and a number of the activities that are being implemented through the Ministry of Sustainable Development, especially the NDA, is really a move to try and accelerate because we're going a bit too slowly, right? Um, the call for project ideas was just one example of us taking one step towards trying to unlock capital, but we really have to unlock capital. The reality is, we cannot keep doing the same things we're doing. We have to make a radical change. And we have to implement projects that have a paradigm shift. So it's not business as usual anymore. It's business unusual. Hence why you heard from Mr. Manners the commitment from the government to support the private sector in also bringing their part, bringing their best, bringing their innovations to market and finding us finding ways collaboratively to find the financing you need because it is going to cost money to do that. Whether it is us mitigating what we did not cause or whether it's us having to just adapt to the reality and build our resilience. So I just want to take the time to thank the Ministry of Sustainable Development and the NDA for the initiative. Um, this project is being implemented by the five C's, that's the Caribbean uh, Center for, CARICOM Development Center uh, for Climate Change. It's based in Belize, and I'm contracted under the five C's to support the NDA in the implementation of projects such as this. I also want to recognize with us today Mr. Andrew Satney. Mr. Satney is the National Project Coordinator for the second or should I say a subsequent, I wouldn't say second, subsequent GCF readiness projects. What happens is the NDA has access uh, through the government a million for up to a million dollars to implement these type of readiness projects, which will now prepare the fertile ground for us to now develop larger concept notes, like the type of concept notes we're attempting to do of maybe 50 million or more. So uh, Mr. Satney's project will now bridge the gap of whatever this small little project has started to do and build upon it. And there are going to be more continu con uh, continuation. So don't be surprised when you see different faces over the coming years with a different project name. We just try and use this million dollars to kind of build that fertile ground for us to really start accessing the type of capital that uh, we are. In the Caribbean, we're very far behind in implementing or even mobilizing climate finance. If you compare all the small island development states and when you look at uh, states like in the, um, in the Pacific Islands, Fiji, Tuvalu, those guys have really been mobilizing all kinds of finance. And even within the private sector, they've even gone to launch green bonds in international markets. So we cannot be sitting here sleeping and waiting for another Hurricane Irma or Maria to, to, to you know, do us out. There's so much things we have to get done. And um, this is why this project is here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our project team. So we have supporting us in the implementation of this um, private sector 
uh, climate, uh, private sector access to climate finance project, so project is the Global Factor team. It's led by Mr. Kepa Salon, and also Kepa. <laughs> He's the team leader. Um, when we had, you probably saw him on the earlier webinars and the earlier uh, virtual, so we're happy to have Kepa in country today. And we have Jocelyn Pass. Jocelyn, she's the second climate finance expert. And then we have Michael Seeprasad as well. And you're very familiar with Michael. He's been on every single engagement. He's the uh, climate finance and also FDI um, finance expert on the team. So without further ado, Kepa, I would like to invite you to the podium. Thank you. So before Kepa joins, some housekeeping matters. Um, a lot of you have registered online and did your RSVP, so great. For those persons, I'll be going around to make sure we do check-ins. But I'm also going to do the traditional paper thing so we can make sure you are doubly recorded and I can show five Cs that you were actually present so we can justify expenditures. Um, also, if I will be sharing with you uh, additional information, um, the, the PowerPoints, a few people have asked me. So yes, you're going to get the slides. So while the presentation is going on, let me do my work. And then secondly, I'll also be sending you a copy of the menu for the buffet we're having this afternoon. Please let me know if you're allergic to something ahead of time so I can make some adjustments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Telly. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Very happy to be here finally, you know, after working in this project for, for a couple of months now, you know, since January. So it's very good to, be, to have the opportunity you know, to be here with you and to share what we have been doing all these months. So basically what we would like to do um, today and tomorrow is to share uh, a little bit the, the results of the project so far. Uh, but it's not just, uh, we don't want this to be a lecture or anything like that, so we want this to be really interactive so that we can discuss you know, the, the outcomes and the results that we have obtained with you to improve uh, you know, the, the main uh, products that have been produced and particularly to define the next steps, okay? Because the, the project is not over yet, we still have to do a couple of things and we will be discussing this in the in the next days so hopefully the presentation is working <laughs> that's very good i have my papers here just in case no i need to improvise a little bit but it seems to be working so i'm very happy to see that so that is basically the the plan for these uh two days as telly mentioned uh i didn't came alone because i have from ecuador jocelyn path and she will be helping me in, in uh, some of the presentations as she's an expert in, in climate finance you know, and she will be helping us with all the content related to that and also michael who came from jamaica even if he's from guyana you know, the warrior and uh, he, he is the private sector specialist in the team so will be he will be um trying to coordinate all the activities related to that, you know, to the involvement of the private sector and the proposal that we have in order to develop an, an action plan. So I don't know if the, this is going to work. Yes. Okay, we need to turn it on or something. Yeah, it works. <laughs> it's working. Okay, uh, well, just as a, uh, just so that you know who is in front of you, just to introduce a little bit that company that we work for, it's Global Factor. Uh, the company is originally from Spain. Uh, this is what explains my weird name, no, Kepa, which probably is the first time you, you hear it. In fact, it's not a Spanish name, it's Basque, because I'm from the north of Spain, from a very small region, and we have a very complicated language, which is Basque. And Kepa, my name basically means Peter. 
Okay, so if you forget about my name, you can call me Peter, and <laughs> I understand that perfectly well. But anyway, the origins of, of the company, the company started in, in Spain, and basically it's a company that does consultancy projects, so we are working in climate change, sustainability, and, and energy, and we work all over the world in projects like this, you know, trying to help countries and the private sector overcome climate change, you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and be better adapted to to climate change. So this is, in a nutshell, what we do. We're a small company. We're 130 people, and we have offices in, in different countries. You know, so that we are closer to our uh, clients and the people we are working with, with you know, in order to develop all these kinds of climate change and energy projects. That's it. Um, so just uh, a little bit of context about the project. Now, this is something that has already been explained by the people who have been talking just before me, and I guess I need to be quick, tell you, because we are like one hour behind the schedule, so I try to be quick with the presentation, but basically the idea of this project is, it has different goals, but the two more important goals are to help the private sector understand and being able to deal with climate change challenges, and in particular to develop climate change projects. So this has like a general component, and we will be working on an action plan in order to help the private sector working towards you know, climate change mitigation and adaptation, but also, uh, as you already know, we will be working on some very specific projects that we think are very important, and we will prepare a concept note, which is basically like a summary of these project ideas to be submitted to the Green Climate Fund. We will be talking about this on the, on the next days. This is a little bit of a summary of the project. It has many different phases and many different components, you know, as all the consultancy projects. But uh, you have in blue the, the uh, activities that we've conducted, not related to workshop or things like that. As Telly already mentioned, we did an online uh, forum at the beginning of the project, and then in July, we have a, a specific workshop to get you familiar with all the climate finance uh, issues with the Green Climate Fund and so on. And the idea of this workshop, which will be like the third workshop of the project, uh, is to, no, um, after all the, the results of the previous workshop, the result of the other activities, to try to summarize what we've done, to try to uh, improve the results of the action plan or, and the analysis that we've conducted, and in particular to try to work on the development on two concept notes, two project ideas that we can, can be submitted to the Green Climate Fund. Which are, and you can see in green, oops, sorry, I don't know how to go back, yeah. This is the pointer. And so, and the two main products, there are lots of, pro of products in the project, but the two main products will be an action plan for the private sector to work towards climate change mitigation and adaptation, and the call for project ideas and the development of two concept notes. Okay, so out of the ideas that you have submitted, we will talk about that later, but we will be working on presenting them in a way that can be acceptable for the Green Climate Fund. Okay, and in order to do that, um, something that we will do today and tomorrow, we also need to give you some content and to explain a little bit the technicalities of the Green Climate Fund. Okay? Because everything is common sense, but uh, as any other international institution, the Green Climate Fund has some specific uh, concepts and terms and you know, uh, methods that we need to understand a little bit so that our proposals can be, can be successful. Uh, this is it. I have already explained the, the, um, the goals for today in particular. Uh, I will be presenting the results of the evaluation, pro of, the evaluation of projects in the few minutes. Uh, and after that, Jocelyn will focus on giving you more background on the existing uh, funding sources that are available for the development of the projects. And in the afternoon, we will focus on how we can move forward with these project ideas when it comes to two particular aspects. One of them is the theory of change, which you know, may, might sound a bit abstract or theoretic to you, but you will see that it's a very practical thing. Those of you who attended the, the workshop in July already know what is theory of change, of course, so you, are, you will be familiar with that. And also we will be working on the environment and social safeguards, okay? how we can address all the environment and social concerns related to projects. So this is basically what we will be doing uh, today. And this is what is explained in the, in the agenda. I will move faster as um, we are a little bit behind schedule. 
Jocelyn, you are the expert with Mentimeter, so. Um, so I will ask you to please access to um, this web page www.menti.com and um, introduce this code so um, you can get access to this uh, activity on Mentimeter. I guess you can also sc scan the QR code. No, that's another, another yeah. option. Is it working? So please let us know if you have any difficulties entering into this um, web page. Um, here you can include the code or you can um, scan the, the code, the QR code. Okay, we have already eight people in the Mentimeter. If you need any help, please, um, you can raise your hand and I can come to uh, assist you. Okay, we have um, 12 persons. Um, we, I think I, we can uh, wait a couple more of minutes. Yeah, if you are already connected to um, the activity, um, please just wait and then it will appear a, a question, um, but um, let us wait a few minutes. Okay, so I think um, we can start. Um, so basically, um, we would like uh, you to introduce what are your expectations for today's workshop. Um, as you know, we are going to cover um, what are, were the uh, principal barriers for the uh, access of the private sector to climate finance. And then we are going to explain some of the different climate funds that are available. And in, and in the afternoon, we are going to make some practical sessions regarding how to um, develop um, some section of the concept node. Specifically, what is the theory of change and the environmental social safeguards. Um, so you can include what are your expectations for today's um, workshop. Uh, it will be useful for us in order to narrow what we are going to cover in this um, workshop. Okay, we have, uh, you would like to learn more about the theory of change, um, to learn as much as possible, of course, uh, better understanding of the theory of change, perfect, we are going to cover that, um, build capacity, enhance knowledge in the co areas covered, um, exposed to climate finance option, uh, we'll definitely cover that. Um, understanding the GCF funding projects to access the GCF funding, um, how to access climate funding, um, how to submit proposals, okay, learning about investment opportunities, um, process for concepts to be submitted to the GCF, um, grant funding, we will cover that in the section of um, the different type of funding um, proposals. Climate finance, okay. Um, getting a better understanding about climate funds, what is available and how to position ourselves to be able to take advantage of available funds, okay. 
there are a lot of interest um, regarding climate funds, um, how to understand and develop a theory of change, and learn as much as possible about accessing funding. Okay, so um, I, I think we have um, a, a little bit more clear about the idea that you are expecting us on this workshop. So thank you a lot. Uh, we will hope to cover all of your expectations. So, <laughs> I think we can do that, can't we? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the only question I have is there was one, someone wrote like, uh, learning to submit proposals that will be accepted. So that might be or that could be accepted. No, that will sound a little bit too strong, which will be accepted for grants. We'll do our best, but I think the other, the other goals are, are feasible. We will work on that. Okay, and you can tell us, no? Um, along the way, I didn't say that, but please ask any question as we go along. Don't wait no, till we finish the session or something, because uh, I, don't the, I don't want this to be a lecture. We want this to be something interactive. Okay, so... Um, do we continue with the presentation? Okay. All right, and recommendations to keep up with, with the work. We'll be talking about that. To get to know the other participants, we, you, we, we'll, we will ask you to join in groups uh, for uh, no, sometime later in order to work in some of the concepts that we will be discussing, to communicate your needs and to let us know if there is something that you don't understand, please don't wait, and also to, of course, to have fun and and participate. I know that f from what I've seen on the, on the results of Mentimeters, you are very interested in the theory of change. So I don't know if <laughs> the, the very name no, sounds like something very exciting. I, I, maybe we will need to lower the expectations, but we will delve into that and we will let you know how it works and how we can use it to prepare successful proposals. Uh, this is me. I don't know what I'm doing here, but uh, I already presented myself. I work in Global Factor, and I am also professor of environmental economics at the University of, of Navarre in, in Spain. Anyway, um, the ideas. Uh, so the, uh, my intention now is to explain a little bit how we have evaluated the different proposals that you submitted. And someone can ask, you know, if you have accepted all of them, why are you going to explain this? And it, it makes sense to explain this because we have accepted them all, but at the same time, we need to make some, we need to adapt them a little bit so that they fit into the GCF criteria. Okay, so I think it's good to explain the process that we follow uh, in order to ask you the, for the project ideas and also how we evaluated them and why we need, we, we believe that we need to make a little bit of an adaptation to what has been submitted. So basically the idea was to try to mobilize private sector ideas, private sector investment uh, in order to find projects that really make sense from the point of view of sustainability and climate change. We were quite broad with the call for projects ideas because we didn't want you to be very constrained by the requirements of the GCF or any other institutions. We wanted to receive very good ideas and then you know, once we have a look at them to tell you whether something has to be adapted or what needs to be changed. Okay, uh, we said like three project categories in terms of size from 50,000 US to 20 million US classified in three different categories. Um, all of these ideas, no, from uh, regardless of the size were acceptable for us and we, were, we have analyzed all of them. Um, no, if, uh, not saying that because it's a bigger project or it's a smaller project, this makes a difference. Okay, what is really relevant for us is the results uh, and the outcomes of the project. No, but this this is what we what we say. No, those are the sizes that we wanted you to to have a look or to keep in mind when presenting the proposals. Uh, when it comes to the process, uh, the launch for project ideas was launched on July the seventh. Uh, of course, before we have done a lot of work, and uh, no, most of you were already aware that we were going to do that, so you have already been working on the project ideas. There was a period in order to receive doubts and questions, which we did, and then uh, the final deadline for the submission of proposal was August 16th. Okay, and after that, what we had to do is to set 
uh, some criteria and some methods in order to evaluate the proposals, and we obtain the results by September the 5th. Okay. Uh, who can apply? We left it very open to uh, associations and enablers, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, SBDC, government bodies, etc., but also financial intermediaries, in particular commercial banks and credit unions, also the service sector. Um, exclu excluding tourism means that uh, these, the activities of the service sector that are related to tourism, we included them in one specific group, which was hotel, restaurant, taxi services, and other tourism-related activities. Also, agro-processing and agribusiness, and manufacturing. And in fact, we received proposal for most of these categories, so we are very happy with the results, not just in terms of number of projects, 16, which is a lot, a lot for a small country, but also uh, how they cover different areas on different sectors, so it's a very promising starting point. Uh, well, uh, I said that we had to prioritize these ideas, so we use a multi-criteria analysis. A multi-criteria analysis is basically a method in which we uh, select the criteria that we believe it's more important in order to evaluate the project. Uh, you can rank the different criteria, you can assign different weights to the different uh, criteria, but we did not do that. We considered that all the criteria have the same weight, and then we assigned scores for each proposal, for each of these criteria, according to some questions. I've given a lot of terminology, but I will explain this in more detail. Those are the four criteria that we thought uh, made sense in order to evaluate in the proposal. This is very similar to the evaluating criteria of the Green Climate Fund. It's a little bit more simple because the GCF has six evaluating criteria, but we, we decided to use four. Okay? In, we will go one by one. Paradigm shift potential, oops, paradigm shift potential, sustainable development potential, country ownership, and product market fit. Those are the four things that we thought um, summarize a little bit the most important aspects of the project when it comes to trying to have access to international funds. Uh, paradigm shift potential, this is um, an expression that has become very popular in the last few years, not only for the Green Climate Fund, but for also for other um, you know, uh, development institutions and agents. It's a little bit hard to define, but the idea is whether the program or project can contribute to achievement of the fund's objective, the idea is how it can produce a bigger impact, a big change. No, it's not just a project that is successful in the scope of this specific project, but how this can multiply its impact no, across a county, across a region, etc. So we set three uh, evaluation questions in order to assess whether each of the proposals uh, could be scored high or not in terms of the paradigm shift potential. Question number one was the level of replication of scalability to other sector, institution, geographical areas or regions, which is not, this is not just about one specific project, you know, in the boundaries of this specific company or organization, how we can, how this project can catalyze change. This is basically what we're trying to see. Also, what is the degree of contribution to knowledge generation or collective learning processes? So, Maybe there, is a, there are a few projects that don't have a very, uh, are not very effective by themselves in terms of the specific impact that they produce, but they will change how we see things. They will produce some capacity building and that can help you know, at, in the second step to uh, make big changes. Okay, and what is the degree of inclusion of sustainability instruments in the project? Looking for long-term and financially sustainable continuity. Okay. Um, some examples for, uh, that, uh, no, in order to understand this, to demonstrate that these beneficiary projects are bankable, that they create track records and are educating the market, and also whether these projects can alter risk per perception of private sector investors for renewable energy or energy efficiency. Those are questions that uh, were in our mind when we assign different scores to the different questions. Okay, the second criteria, it's very obvious and very simple, is sustainable development. So where we have a look at the benefits and priorities in terms of environmental, economic, social, and gender equality of the project. No? Does the project really change things in terms of sustainability? We have already seen a video about the SDGs. No? So we're going in that direction, not trying to measure what is the impact of, of this project. No? So we consider the key evaluation questions were, were what is the project level of fostering of positive environmental externalities, okay, in terms of 
uh, reduction of air, improvements of air quality, soil quality, conservation, biodiversity, etc. Also, to what degree does the project promote social and economic development in the area? Not just the environment, it's very important, but also in which way no, there are social and economic uh, positive impacts. And also, what is the level of integration of the gender aspect in the project? Okay, so those were the three questions that we used in order to score uh, the different projects uh, in terms of sustainable development. And some examples, like a project that improves the air quality by reducing the burning of fossil fuels obviously has a positive environmental impact, or in terms of gender, projects that encourage the creation of female employment and participation of women in decision-making processes for us are very relevant in order to take this into account. Okay, this is the second criteria. Criteria number three is country ownership. That's, again, another criteria from the Green Climate Fund, another uh, international development agencies, which is how this project really makes sense in terms of the country policy. Because this is not like, you, know, you cannot go with a project like a paratrooper and you know, land in the middle of a country and say, this is what you have to do. Because if this project is not consistent with the policies and the regulation in this country, this project is going to fail. Sadly, you no. Know? So this is something that has to be taken into account. The evaluation questions here was where: what is the degree of alignment of the project with other local programs and projects? Okay, is it this project alone, or it is part of an ecosystem of projects you know, that are really trying to foster uh, change in this regard? What is the level of alignment of the project with national climate strategy and country priorities? Uh, here we didn't. Um, we were very. Um, I don't know, I don't know if generous is the word, but we were not worried about whether you specifically said my project is consistent with the national program X, Y, or Z. We understood no, that from what you were saying, no? and this is something that we added to your proposals in order to evaluate them. And also, what is the level of alignment of the project with other existing country policies? Okay, this is the idea of country ownership. As an example, whether it contributes to the country's uh, to the NDC, whether this help us meet our climate change uh, international commitments, and also if it helps closing the gap no, and with clean energy. Okay. This is also something that we looked at. And the last criteria, which is the criteria that is a, a little bit more specific for this call for project, is not exactly part of the GCF investment criteria, it's what we call product market fit. Okay, and what we, we were looking at whether there is an alignment between the solution and the market needs, whether we believe that this proposal makes sense from a market perspective. Okay? So the key evaluation questions here were, were what is the problem solving level of the value proposition, how it helps solve problems that already exist, what is the level of marketability in the long term, and what is the degree of development of the new technologies or the promotion of new business models. Okay? How innovative is your, your proposals? And some examples here, uh, whether enough users or customers use your product regularly, or whether users or customers are choosing to pay for this product or services, or we believe they will be able in the future. Okay, so this is something we, we were looking at. Um, then for each question, we assigned a score, which uh, could rank between zero if we believe that this proposal uh, didn't comply or no. The answer to the question was very negative, 0 0.5 if it was somewhere in the middle, and one if we believe that the answer to the question was clearly yes. Okay? And we obviously justified all our answers. There was a team of eight uh, evaluators participating in the, assigning the scores to the different proposals. Uh, both for uh, the Global Factor team and also from uh, St. Kitts and Nevis team, including government and GCF readiness program specialists. So we, uh, what we did was to calculate the average of the scores given by the eight evaluators. Um, it has already been mentioned that we received um, higher than expected number of proposals, truth be told. We received 16 proposals and related to many different topics. So we were super happy with that. We have Proposals related to sustainability, climate resilient, agriculture, water management, tourism. There were many, many different proposals, and we were very happy with that. The budget were very, no, uh, di differ a lot from one proposal to the other, between 50,000 US dollars to 33 million. Okay, and also the lifespan was very different, between two and 50 years. So we have a huge variety of, of proposals, which is really, really uh, good. 
Okay, the, this is the, the total result, so the average score of the projects of the 16 project was 87%, which is you know, very, uh, very high marks, no? you pass with flying colors. Um, in terms of paradigm shift potential, the, the average score was very high, 91%. In terms of sustainable development, it was also quite high, 88%. So we were quite comfortable that these ideas no, really are, not, are going to promote change and they're going to make a big difference in terms of sustainable development. Also, uh, and that was very clear no, from your proposal, that they aligned very well with, with the country regulations, policies, practices, and so on. So the score for country ownership was very high and a little bit lower in terms of product market fit because we were a little bit unsure about how some of these proposals could really make sense in terms of marketability. Okay, but still the, the average score was, was quite high. Okay, um, so... Um, we said, no, uh, Telly mentioned at the beginning that all the proposals were accepted, and that is good. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we needed to adapt them a little bit. So I'm going to explain this because this is, I think it, this is very important. Um, the proposals were good in terms of par uh, no, a paradigm shift, in case of sustainable development, country ownership, in terms of uh, um, product market fit. But in terms of fitting into the GCF criteria and the GCF requirements, sometimes it was not so straightforward. Sometimes because of size, okay, some ideas were really good, but you cannot submit a proposal of 50,000 US dollars to the Green Climate Fund. Okay, they, they say that the sweet spot of the Green Climate Fund is 60 million US dollars. So that's the size of projects where the GCF is more comfortable because no, the time and money that they require in order to approve a proposal, for them, it's like a very cumbersome process, so they need projects to have a relative size, no? to, to be not very small, because otherwise they would need to accept lots of proposals, and that would be a little bit more, more complicated. So there were questions in terms of size, but also in terms of a scope, because some of the proposals were very specific for one company, and this obviously makes a lot of sense, but we cannot submit a proposal to the GCF just to improve or to change the products or the processes of one specific company because the GCF wants proposals to be a little bit broader. Okay, so what we did was to group the different proposals in, some, in something that is called a programmatic proposal. So instead of proposing each of these um, ideas individually, we group them into a programmatic proposal. Okay, so we prepared we, our idea. We have two different proposals. I'm gonna go through them that summarize the, the project ideas that we received. So the first one would be to the implementation of a local program to help private sector unlock climate finance. So what we're going to do is to create a facility that is able to fund all your project ideas. Okay, instead of not taking each project idea individually to the GCF, we're not gonna be successful with that. But if we aggregate these ideas and we create a facility in the country that can fund all, all these proposals, we can be successful. So this is the approach that we follow. Uh, we believe it's you know, the only feasible way of submitting this proposal to the GCF. And the second proposal, uh, it's a little bit more focused in terms of the capacities of the private sector so that the private sector has more capacities to develop this project, is more ready in terms of climate change adaptation and has the mechanism in order to submit proposals. So we will go proposal by proposal, but our goal was to uh, no, like develop two project ideas out of your project ideas no, by grouping them. Okay? So um, for this first idea, this is related to funding or providing finance to the different projects, whether it's grants, whether it's um, no, loans, whether it's credit lines, whatever. So this idea is focused on that. Uh, we were thinking of three outcomes. You will be familiar with the idea of outcomes maybe more in the afternoon, but we wanted to be able to provide green finance credit lines and grants. We also wanted to provide technical support and awareness building to all the proponents of the project, and we also wanted to have a solid project management for this, for this initiative. You know, those are the three components, or the three outputs that we wanted to achieve. So um, we have uh, disaggregated this in various outputs. Output one is financial institutions can provide green finance credit and grant lines to the private sector. We already know that you are a little bit, some of you are a little bit 
um, how can I say it, skeptical about the, the role of the financial sector. This is what we have seen, no? because we will talk about that tomorrow, but we have conducted some interviews with you guys, and we understand that some of you believe that the financial sector in the country maybe is not ready to fund this type of initiative. This is what we really want to change, okay? So to do that, we have prepared a list of activities so that the financial institutions can provide green credit lines for investments in energy, water management, and agriculture projects. So we have been looking at the project that you submitted. And it's also able to develop grants for the investment in, this, in all these sectors, okay? And to provide technical assistance so that no, we create a facility that's able to fund your, your projects. Um, the second output, all right, yeah. Right now, yeah, okay. Okay, Tell is suggesting that we take a break now and we continue after the break with these uh, proposals. So how long will it take, 30 minutes or? 30 minutes, so okay, so we take a break and we come back at half past, uh, sorry, at uh, 11.30, okay? If you go out onto the hall,
to, um, in one particular point in time, finance this project. We also want this to produce a big change no, in, the, in the sector, and in order to do that, we need to facilitate that change in terms of knowledge. Okay? And the uh, third output would be to establish a dedicated and responsible team that is able to manage and oversee all the different activities and can continue working on this in the country after that. Okay? And the second proposal uh, is not exactly the, not the same type of proposal than the previous one. This is more oriented towards a readiness program. Okay? So not specifically to fund project, but to provide the necessary change in the country so that these ideas can be originated and can be implemented. So in this case, the title of the uh, program would be the implementation of an action plan to address private sector climate finance barriers in St. Kitts and Nevis, which is also uh, a consequence of the work that we have been doing in identifying and dealing with these barriers, and this will be the focus on the, of the workshop for tomorrow. Okay? And the main outcomes that we were expecting are related to socialization and capacity building, also to the implementation of a mechanism for monitoring, reporting, and verification of the action plan, and also evidence-based uh, product design of adaptation. Okay? We will have components for all of these uh, potential outcomes. So the first uh, output would be the formation of a technical group that is able to provide technical uh, support and to orient the, you know, the implementation of the action plan. The second one is to uh, provide with a communication and socializing tools so that the private sector is aware of all the different existing mechanisms you know, and can have access to them. Um, the output number three is related to the training of the different stakeholders and people, you know, for both from the public and private sector, so that we can move ahead with all this. And uh, the second, well, the second component, no, the, and therefore an, another output is to have a sustainable development process with a monitoring, reporting, and verification system for the action plan. So it's not just something that is written on paper and left on a shelf. On a shelf. This is something that we want to be continuing to be implemented over time with indicators, actions, and, and so on. And uh, the last uh, component is related to climate change risk and vulnerability assessment. And in this case, because we have seen no, that uh, the different uh, agents, stakeholders in the country are more aware of mitigation than adaptation, so we really want to help with that. And the idea would be to elaborate a climate change risk assessment study and to analyze the different, uh, the most vulnerable sectors, areas, and components, and then after that to do some validate on workshop and to prevent, prepare some actions in order to overcome the vulnerability of the different sectors and regions. So those are basically the, the two proposals that uh, we have prepared as a, consequence, as a consequence of the different project ideas that were submitted, and we will continue working on them uh, throughout these workshops today and, and tomorrow. So I don't know if you have any questions or comments, and after that I will give the floor to my colleague Jocelyn. Yeah, please. In terms of Yeah, the the first project idea, the one related to climate finance, we, it will work both with mitigation and adaptation. So we didn't want to establish a distinction there, and we want financial institution to provide grants and finance to activities related to both mitigation and adaptation. But the second project idea that has a more broader approach, you know, the readiness approach, uh, we believe that it was important to establish one specific component related to adaptation, because from what we've seen in terms of knowledge of a specific impact, the private sector is a little bit behind. You know? They are more aware of mitigation than adaptation. So that's why we wanted to add that component in that uh, second project idea. But for the first one, when it comes to funding, uh, to find in fine, uh, finance and so on, we were including both mitigation and adaptation actions. Any questions? Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay. okay. Just lean.
Okay. So I will could um can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um so um now it's my turn, thank you. Um Kepa. Um, well, I, I just wanted uh, to present me. I am Jocelyn Paz. I am also part of the Global Factor team. I am an environmental engineer and I have experience implementing projects related to climate change, climate finance, and environmental management. So it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, um, so in this session, I would like to talk about climate and sustainable funds. Um, in the previous workshops, uh, we have talked a lot about the GCF, their investment criteria, also what are the different financial modalities. And here, I just want to um, present some other climate and sustainable funds that you can have access in order to submit your funding proposal. Um, so before we go through that, it's important um, to clarify and understand some um, keywords that you are going to definitely find in the uh, documents and the web page of some sustainable funds. So here are some of them. Um, the first one is the um, priority sector, and this means a specific area that is designated as having a strategic importance to be funded. Um, the second one is the project size, and this is basically the budget of the project that is going to be uh, financed. Um, the third one is the key investment criteria, and this is very important to consider because this varies according to the different climate funds. And this is basically the requirements and qualifications that is important to be considered in order uh, to a funding proposal be eligible. So um, it, this is an important thing to uh, revise in the different type of climate funds. Um, also, another aspect to be um, considered is definitely the deadline of the application, and this will also vary according the different um, type of climate funds. Um, some have open deadlines. You can submit applications through the entire year, and in other type of climate funds, you only have a, a specific date, so it is important to consider that when developing the different um, concept note or prior proposal. Proposals. Um, another aspect to consider is a proposal template, and this will definitely help you because um, this document gives you an outline of what you have to include in your project proposal. And uh, at last, we have also the proposal guideline, and this document you could also have access in the um, climate funds. Some of them have these guidelines that are basically the instruction on how to structure your project proposal, what are the key investment criteria to be considered, and the deadline. So these um, two documents, the proposal template and the proposal guideline, will definitely help you when um, constructing and structuring your project project proposal. Um, also, one of the things that uh, you definitely have to check when searching some climate funds are the financial instrument. And there are um, different types, uh, several types of financial instruments. And we have identified one of the common ones that you can um, get access to the different climate funds that are um, eligible so for the Caribbean countries. So um, the first one are um, the grants. And these are um, a type of financial instrument that can be delivered through cash, goods, services, and they ha have the characteristics that they um, don't have uh, a repayment requirement. And um, some activities that uh, can be funded through grants are um, information generation, data analysis, and capacity building. Um, another type of financial instrument are the debts, and in contrast of the grants, this type of financial instrument um, does require repayment. And some examples of debts are um, loans and credit lines. 
Another type of financial instrument that you can uh, find in the different climate funds are equity, and this basically financial instrument that consists of an investment in a project or an asset in order to leverage the debt and get some um, better returns. And um, some examples of equity um, can be um, come from the public or the private sector. Um, another type of uh, financial instrument are quasi equity, and this is a very particular financial instrument because have a characteristic of both a debt and an equity. And um, the difference is that um, uh, this type of financial instrument have a higher risk than a debt, but a lower risk than a um, equity. So um, some examples of these financial instruments are subordinated loans, mezzanine loans, preferred stocks, and convertible bonds. And finally, we have the heuristic uh, financial instrument that basically the objective of this uh, financial is to reduce the risk of the investment. And some example of these are the guarantees, and there are different type of guarantees. There are the ones that cover all the, the investment, and the partial guarantee, well, as the name is called, um, it covers a, the, a, a partial um, or, or a percentage of the investment. So um, th these are the different types of the financial instrument, and you must um, search for what type of uh, financial instrument are you interested when searching for the climate fund. So. Um, it is also important um, to consider several steps when searching the correct um, climate or sustainable fund, um, depending on the characteristic of your project. So first of all, we have uh, defined the project uh, objective or purpose. And this is very important, knowing uh, what are you going to fund. It will definitely help you to identify what type of fund are you looking for. The second one is, uh, of course, researching the funding sources. And uh, we have uh, identified a numerous database and platforms that could be helpful for you um, for um, the identifying and choosing the correct climate fund according to the characteristic of the project. And in the next slide, I will talk about some of them. Um, the third one is to review the eligible criteria, and this is very important, as I was saying, because uh, this will define if your project is eligible or not. And the investment criteria can vary according to uh, within the different climate funds. Some of them, like for example, the GCF consider the ownership, um, they consider the paradigm shift, what are the potential, if it is targeting mitigation or adaptation projects. Um, well, these are some examples of the investment criteria that you have to consider when developing the concept notes or the funding proposals. Um, the next step is to check deadlines. And this is very important because uh, we have identified that some of the projects that have been developed may um, have missed some deadlines and some of them um, opened the next year. So that is very important to consider um, the deadlines when developing the concept notes. And of course, it is important to calculate how much uh, will cost the implementation of the project. And it's important to be realistic and also identify what type of financial instruments are you interested. And after you have reviewed the eligible criteria, check deadlines, check um, how much is the, your budget, um, it is important to start to prepare a proposal. And in this step, you should uh, want to uh, review if there is a, a, a template or a guidelines that will help you and give you some instruction on how to structure the project proposal because um, the requirements of the funds are different. The templates, as you will see in the next slide, are um, different. So it is important to review if there are a template or a guideline that could be useful for you. And then it's also important, of course, to submit the application and also to monitor and follow up the submission. Some of the funds will um, send you some comments or questions, so it is important for you to be prepared to make some clarification if it is required. 
So here are some of the steps, and I will also like to um, give you some um, helpful tips when um, searching for funds and developing your project proposal or your concept note. So first of all, it is important to identify keywords um, that are related to your project's objectives. This can be helpful um, in, in searching the, the correct climate fund and also um, similar proposals that have been developed and already approved. So you can have this an example of what have already, be already approved by the, the fund. Also, it's important to engage. Uh, networking is very important when identifying what type of financial source you could get and also what type of collaborations you could get when implementing the project. So engagement is very important. And finally, as I said, it's important to explore some online funding database and platforms that are available uh, for um, climate and sustainable projects. So we are going to see some of these examples. This person is the NDC partnership uh, online database. And this um, database will give you a list of climate funds that um, support or invest projects related to mitigation or adaptation projects. So um, in, in this online database, you only have to um, include keywords and include some information that will be helpful in order to identify which is the correct font um, that matches with the requirements of your project. So for example, in this case, you can um, include what is the recipient of the funding, um, on what regions or countries is your project will be implemented, um, what is the purpose of the, of the support, uh, what is your climate objective? Is the project going to target mitigation or adaptation? Um, what are the sectors or topics that you are going to be uh, interested or related to your project? And um, is you can also identify what type of financial instruments and financial conditions uh, you are going uh, to be interested in your project. So um, these are some of the information that you could include and you will definitely have in the preliminary stage of the developing of the concept node. So um, here you have the link. When we share with you your presentation, you will have the link and you could um, get access to this database. So this is the NDC partnership database. And also there is the Ramsar um, database. And in this case, this database will give you a list of organizations from the private or public sector um, that finances projects related to promoting wetland conservation, white use, and restoration. And uh, as similar as the NDC partnership, you will also have to include what is your geographic um, interest. Uh, you can include some keywords related to your project's objective. Um, you could also include information on what type of organization would you would like to um, receive the financial support. And in this case, um, this database in, um, includes only list of organizations that provides grants. So here you can include the budget that you will need for the implementation of the project. So here is also the link of this database if you will have, uh, you would like to have access of, to that. And finally, we also have this database um, named the Climate Fund Inventory. And basically, um, it is the same dynamic. You have, to, um, you have here a list of the different climate and sustainable funds. Um, you could choose them. Um, you have also include what topic or sectors are you interested uh, based on your project. And finally, what type of financial mechanism would you like to get access? And of course, here is the link if you have um, more information. So um, here, uh, until now, um, you, you uh, are aware of what are the keywords that you are going to find in the different um, databases and platforms, uh, what are the aspects to be considered when um, searching these um, climate funds. And now I will I'd like to um, show you some examples of programs and databases and funds that we have uh, identified through these databases. So um, 
The first one is the climate, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Caribbean Climate Investment Program. And this is a program that targets um, projects or supports projects related to mitigation and adaptation projects. Um, and specifically, the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and adaptation solutions. Um, these programs award um, 10 grants, and per each grant, it is, um, they, they support projects up to 1 million per grant. And these are only available for the Caribbean organizations. So this is uh, one of the investment criteria that they consider. Um, as I mentioned, they uh, the only available or eligible uh, projects will be that come from the Caribbean-based business organization. Um, of course, they only will um, invest or support projects related to energy efficiency, renewable energy, and adaptation technology solutions. They will also require that in the project proposal, it is important to explain um, how the project will be um, able to address the different barriers and pro um, problems related to climate change. And they will also like to explain uh, or demonstrate the feasibility of the implementation of the proposed set activity. So these are um, some criteria that are going to be, it's important to be considered when um, submitting your project proposal. And um, as I mentioned, they um, awards grants. And in this case, the deadline for application is on November the 5th of this year. So um, it is uh, important data to consider. And of course, this is the link if you want um, more information. And I would like to show you some of the templates. And as you will see, um, there are quite similar. Um, some of them require more information, but um, this is um, the general what they ask. Um, they will ask the cover page with um, a general information of the project um, to provide a, an executive summary of the project. Uh, it is important to explain what is the context, uh, the problems, and the barriers that the project will be addressing, what are the activities and the proposed um, solution of the project. You will also be asked to provide analysis data that supports um, your project. Um, you will also like to include information of what is the proponent, um, the component, or the organization profile. Um, it will also ask to include information related to the budget of the project and uh, a justification of the funding, asking funding, and a preliminary task or um, timeline for the implementation of the activities. And also here is a, uh, there are some screenshots of what are um, going to be shown in the proposal um, guidelines. So um, it is important that you um, review this for more information on how to structure your project proposal. So um, here is a brief description of the program, uh, what are the eligible criteria, and what are the type of financial instrument that in this case is the, the grants. And here uh, is another example of program um, the Caribbean Catastrophe um, um, Risk Insurance Facility. Um, they support um, projects related to disaster risk management, capacity building, environmental management, etc. Um, so they support projects um, that range between uh, $5,000 to $25,000 um, per project. And uh, basically, this fund supports all organizations that come from the Caribbean um, countries. And they also provide grants. And in this case, for example, this is a program that is open through all of the year, but they only review uh, projects uh, proposed every quarter. So um, this is also a, a great opportunity to submit some um, project proposals. And here is, of course, the link. And here are some of the examples of what are you going to be um, saw in, in the proposal template. Of course, the information of the organization, um, the information of the contact person of the project, um, of course, the project information, 
and the budget and the timeline. As, as you can see, this is a very simple um, um, proposal template. So it will be easier to structure this project proposal. And of course, here you can have also access to proposal guidelines. And as you can see, um, these um, documents are available and will be helpful when developing your project proposal. And another example are the infrastructure for resilient Iceland states. Um, they support um, different uh, projects that target to increase the resilience of the infrastructure of different sectors, um, including the energy, telecommunication, transport, health, water, and coastal infrastructure. And they support um, projects um, that come from a single country project uh, re uh, that range between 150000 to uh, $500,000. And they also support projects um, that come from multi-country projects, and the projects that they can support are up to say $750,000. So it is also important to consider that. And they also support all the small um, development states um, from the Caribbean country, okay? And um, they also uh, grant awards. Uh, the deadline in this case have already passed, but um, I'm sure that they will open in the next year, so it is important to stay tuned through this um, link. And here is some of example of this template. I will go um, very fast in here. It is quite similar to the other templates that we have already um, seen. And of course, here are the proposal guidelines that will help you to develop your project proposal. And finally, um, this is a, a another fund called the Sell Small Enterprise Assistance Funds. And basically, these funds support small and medium enterprises um, that would like to implement projects related to these priority sectors. Um, the key investment criteria is that they only support sectors related to manufacturing, tourism, agribusiness, healthcare, training, financial inclusion, renewable energy, uh, retail distribution, and transport. Um, they will only in, um, receive projects that come from English-speaking countries from the Caribbean um, region, and uh, the project will need to support or accomplish some um, the sustainable development goal. So this is important to consider also. Um, in this case, they are grant uh, equity and quasi-equity. And in this case, this fund um, receives uh, step submission across all the, the year. So here's the link if you uh, want more information. Here is also um, a quick preview of the proposal template that you must consider when developing the, the project proposal. So these are some of the examples the, of the different type of climate funds, what are the templates, as you can see, are very similar um, through each of the funds and inclusive to the GCF climate fund. Um, so um, I am open to any questions or doubt if you have. Is there any questions? I know I was yeah, I will try to go quick. Mm -hmm. Questions? No. Okay, so I so think we'll go. Yeah. Are you sure you don't have any questions? No? Is 
this useful for you? I mean, I know that it's um, that uh, no, we're talking about uh, giving you a lot of information, no? And uh, Jocelyn has gone through many different um, uh, existing funds or options in order to fund projects. I don't know if you see that these options are close to the ideas that you have in mind, or how do you feel about that? No? Yeah, please. I can give you the microphone. Uh, the, it's sort of like half question, half statement, but in writing some of these proposals, we come from a very small island, and I remember in the past um, facing issues like its scalability and you know it going to larger islands because they want to have more impact. But some of the projects that we have in mind, in our mind, they're more regional, like inclusive of different islands for them to be most effective. But sometimes in writing a proposal, you know, being based here, you can see how you can incorporate the other islands, but seeing that the other islands are, you know, different jurisdictions and different um, setups, like how do you encompass a multi-island approach when writing a proposal, like I'm based in St. Kitts, but what I'm looking at, for instance, say I want to do something in transport into Ireland, something that's um, more environmentally friendly, but I'm based here, um, my knowledge is here, but I want to include the region, at least the OECS and spreading mm. out. <laughs> As I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a funny thing, like when writing the proposals now, you have to not just consider St. Kitts, but now you have to, incorporate the other islands and that can be a bit of a challenge especially if you're not in these other regions or have persons in these other regions like mm. just it's, yeah <laughs> yeah it's a very good question in fact i don't know what jocelyn you want to ask if not i you're right that uh, when it comes to this type of uh, multilateral funding or international funding the, the scope of matters, no? and the, the bigger the size of the project and the more countries are involved, you know, the more islands, that is something that is also uh, very positive for the institutions that fund th these projects. So um, how, you can, how can you overcome that difficulty? That is a bit of a challenge. Probably you know, the, most of these uh, financial institutions, and in particular the, the Green Climate Fund, what they have is you cannot submit your proposals directly. You need to use an intermediary, you know, an agency that has been accredited um, to this entity and that those are the entities that really can submit the proposals. You know? So, for example, uh, Telly mentioned that in this project, the five Cs, uh, you know, like the coordinating entity, which is the Caribbean Climate Change Community Center, if if I'm right, no, this is the five Cs, where they come from, which is an institution that works in different countries of the Caribbean, helping the development of project ideas, helping governments in all the aspects related to readiness to climate finance and so on. And there are other institutions that are also accredited to the Green Climate Fund, you know, the Inter-American Development Bank or the, the CAF Development Bank. There are some institutions that operate in different countries, and the, the role of these institutions is to identify the projects to help the development of this project and to present or submit these projects to the Green Climate Fund. So these institutions also play a, real, a role in trying to scale up the projects because even if it's an idea that you have in St. Kitts and Nevis, probably it's an idea that can be applied into other similar countries. No? So that is something that they will help you to do and that it is very relevant no? because as we said, no, um, the bigger uh, in terms of a scope, the better, and also because of the size um, issue that we talked about before, that if it's a very small project, just all the, I mean, there is no limit in terms of what is the minimum size of a project. Well, there is some limit, but they are very flexible. But on the other hand, you know that if you go with a very small project, 
for them it's not worth it because all the procedures that they need, all the discussions with governments and so on, for a very small project, they're not going to be interested. So my suggestion would be to use the, um, the, the, the potential that these uh, institutions that are accredited to the Cl Green Climate Fund can provide, no? and they are operating in different countries and they can provide you with that, with that context. And also, the Green Climate Fund, for example, uh, organizes dialogues, you know, which are sessions in which people from different countries go and um, present ideas, meet with people from other countries. I, the last one I've been in the Caribbean was in Grenada, and I think it was like 2020 or something like that. So probably there have been other uh, uh, you know, Green Climate Fund dialogues. And pr the goal of these dialogues is precisely not so that People from different countries can talk to each other, they can identify ideas together, and they can work on them. So that's another tool or another instrument that can be helpful in this regard. Okay. Um, yes, and can I ask somebody like Tilly, for instance, or anybody else in here that's working in government? Um, you, you list out these um, institutions that facilitate what you just spoke about, but uh, do you also work with the government itself, or government reps, to really, like, I, I find it's just amazing that in the Caribbean we are so segmented, so is there a push to get the governments to really be more collaborative and to really start bridging, like breaking down those borders so that we can you know, a small islands on our own, we can't do much, but if we can come together, it, do you know if there's a push for that? If they're in talks with the governments, is there anything being facilitated in that way so that we can have that being promoted, that togetherness? I guess that's a question for the government. I don't know if you... Okay, and I'd like to add, I don't know if it's a naive comment, but probably, I guess, just from the private sector perspective, I don't know what is the role of Chamber of Commerce, uh, business association, and so on, and whether they are linked you know, from one island, one country to another country. I don't know if there are you know, networks in order to foster this kind of okay. creating. Okay, sorry, practice. the mic wasn't on before, but um, I don't think the chamber is, is here. Right, so 
I think having a, an umbrella body for the private sector, which we, we rely on the chamber um, to provide us information and contacts relevant to the private sector. Um, so wherever you have an umbrella body that you can use, if there's, you can link with the chamber in Antigua or um, Barbados, wherever, um, that's another route you could go, or you could use the government to contact the chamber to find out what's going on in the other countries. Uh, what we found in the, in the workshop in July is that a lot of the small businesses here, they don't associate with the, the chamber because they feel like the chamber represents certain large, larger businesses. So the, there's a bit of a, a gap. Like big companies? Or yes. Hmm. Uh, whereas the smaller entrepreneurs don't feel that the chamber necessarily represents them. Mm. Uh, so that is where that gap has to be filled by the small business ministry, I believe, or uh, they can form their own association. But I think going through the different associations in the different islands or uh, through your government contacts, you could get the information that you need. Mm -hmm. okay. If I could just add Kepa. Please. Use the mic, Michael. The mic. I talk my voice <laughs> Your professor voice, but yeah. <laughs> yes, I was saying it doesn't take away the requirements from you as an entrepreneur to set up your own networking and your own partnerships, all right? There are also regional bodies that you could go to um, to find partners. You mentioned Chamber of Commerce, yes. Carbon export does a lot of work in the region, and you could interface with them. Um, I just completed an assignment with UN Women, and they do a lot of networking um, around the region, particularly the OECS. Right. So yes, governments, yes, would support you, but as an entrepreneur, you have to develop your own network, your own partnership, build clusters within the region, right? and use regional bodies to do your research. All right, that's what I would, would, would add. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy as it could be, but still there are ways, no, in order to move in that direction. Is the market, economy is a skill. The market in St. St. Kitts and Nevis, or all the individual islands are very small. It makes any project, the, the commercial viability of any project in a real very, very challenging. So while you operate locally, you have to start to think regionally and then eventually globally. But start in the region, um, but you have to put in some legwork. You have to, to put in some legwork. One of the problems we have in the region is that we have an idea, we don't want to share it with anybody because we're scared that they steal that idea and run ahead with it, right? We got to take some chances, we got to take risks. Entrepreneurship is all about risk management. I'm not taking a risk, but just managing that risk carefully. And if you don't share your idea and try to get a network around you to develop the idea, somebody's going to come up with the idea. You know, somebody's going to come up with it at some point in time, right? You know, um, that's my two cents there. Michael, there is a. Can you give her the microphone? Okay, so um, am I to understand that five C's is like an accredited point for submission of projects? Yes. Okay, so if someone in St. Kitts has a particular idea, I'm talking private sector, and someone in, say, okay, Antigua, has a similar idea. Is there a mechanism at five C's or, or, or where else, wherever else to bring the parties together for collaboration or introduce them? I'm wondering if that type of mechanism is in place at a point as such to facilitate the networking process and the scalability that is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes, as we already I, I, I would say in, answer to, in response to the first question, 
that FICES is an accredited body to receive funding directly from um, the Green Climate Fund. But in terms of going through, the vehicle to go through to get to the Clean Climate Fund is the NDA, right? Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, or no project can go to the Green Climate Fund without going through the NDA. It must, it, it must be reflective of the country um, priorities, okay? But I think, the, I think 5Cs could facilitate networking within the region. Not only 5Cs, the Caribbean Development Bank is an accredited entity as well. They can receive funding and they do a lot of networking in the region as well. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned the Caribbean Export, probably the premier body for networking among, even though climate change matters have not really been very high on the agenda, it's getting there. Right, it's getting there. So yeah, I would think that 5Cs could, hmm. if they are climate related um, um, ideas, opportunities among several countries, I think the 5Cs could be able to, to harness that and bring them together. But to get the funding, you'll have to go through the NDA. You know, you'll have to go through the NDA. Yes, of course. Yeah. And specifically to your, regarding your, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, there, there are several agencies, um, accredited ent entities across the Caribbean, uh, not just 5Cs. So there are others. Uh, we tend to use 5Cs and CDB because we have a relationship with them, but they're different accredited entities. And they would approach the different countries and say, okay, uh, from their perspective, they are aware of this is a priority for all countries, uh, whether it be electric vehicles, or uh, any other climate related matter. And it's through, through those regional um, entities that we normally get to participate in regional projects. Um, because otherwise our perspective would just be local, right? So the funds that we get from the GCF, we can, we have access to 1 million US every year to fund certain activities. We can choose as the NDA to use that funding for local activities or we can allocate those funds towards a larger regional initiative if we choose to do so. And so it's, tr it's through this network of accredited entities that we get information about what's going on in the Caribbean. Uh, what, one of the projects that we put forward to the Green Climate Fund is a, a 40 million US trans water project which, which involves desalination, etc. And there was a similar project in Barbados that is already funded by the Green Climate Fund and is very successful. And so that is a kind of benchmark for the other Caribbean islands. So we use that information to inform our initiatives here. Um, it's not always that we would want to link up with them because you know we have our own circumstances. And some of these projects are already pretty big as they are. Like our water project was, I said, 40 million US. You know, if you're talking about teaming up with Antigua and Barbados, you have 100 million US, uh, 200 million US dollars, which may, t may take even longer for the, the Green Climate Fund to approve, right? Okay, that was an interesting topic. Unless you have another question or comment, we're going to move on to the theory of change, finally. No? This is <laughs> what you said at the beginning on the Mentimeter, that you really would love to know about theory, theory of change. So here it is. Uh, OK. Um, okay. So um, well, the theory of change, no, at least to me, the first time I heard that sounded like a philosophical no, uh, theory by some weird philosopher, but it's something more simple than that, okay? Sorry to disappoint you maybe, but it's basically a methodology, okay? It's a way of dealing with projects that are very difficult to measure, okay? So the idea, some people say that it dates back to the 1950s, but in reality, in the 1990s, there was not a theory of change as such, and it's basically a logical framework in order to show and understand how a project can change reality, okay? It's, not, it's being used by the Green Climate Fund, but it's being used by many different uh, international organizations, donors, state agencies, and so on. 
Um, specifically, specifically, when you are trying to measure uh, social impact, when you are trying to measure environmental impacts, or things that are very complicated to measure. Okay, so it's it's a way of um, linking the dots in a project so that you can really understand how this project changes reality and to be able to show it to a institution, to an institution that is going to fund this project. Okay, so it's like a logical uh, framework. In fact, you know, before the theory of change in international cooperation, many people were using something that was called the logical framework, no? which was a way of summarizing the different steps of a project. This is a little bit more uh, comprehensive. No? It allows you to see the synergies between the different components, and it's very focused on showing how this project really changes things. So it's not like, yeah, I'm going to uh, do a project on renewable energy. Well, that's good, but you have to show me you know, how this project is going to go and how we can make sure that this project is really going to change the lives of the people, the life of the community, you know, in the place where you're going to install it. So it's trying to uh, give a comprehensive view of, of, different, of different projects. Okay? Uh, so you will see that it has some technical components, some technical concepts that we will understand and go through them, and it is trying to show the connection of all these components uh, to eventually you know, show that this project will be successful, you know, that it can be approved. So basically, the idea is to start with the rationale for a project. You need to show that this project really makes sense because this institution receives hundreds or thousands of projects, so you really need to prove how this project really changes things and also to show that it can, in terms of climate change, that it can make a very important change towards low carbon, when it comes mitigation or adaptation. Okay? And it helps this institution understand the project and approve it, but also it helps you uh, better plan a project, you know, to plan the different components and see how they are linked together. Okay? Um, these are the objectives of uh, theory of change. So. Uh, the first one is to agree on the necessary steps, okay? So if we really want to change these, we're going to have to do X, Y, Z, and whatever. To link different projects, because the idea is that projects are not isolated, no? This was a very old mistake by uh, official development aid, no? That uh, each agency was funding different projects, and they were not connected to each other, and at the end, you change very little, no? If you are working in an isolated way. Also, to mitigate the risks, one of the most important components of the theory of, ch of change is trying to identify the risks of the project and how you can mitigate them, which is also super relevant. Um, it allows you to work in terms of gaining a stakeholder ownership, not just country ownership, but just to make sure that the stakeholders that will be affected by this project are okay with it and will support it and will be you know, positively affected by it. It improves accountability because as you have to detail so well the different steps of a project, then it's very simple to go and make sure that it has been conducted or not and what are the implications. And also to, it helps you plan and uh, evaluate you know, the achievements of your, of your project. One of the most complicated things in international cooperation is the exposed evaluation of a project. No? Because if you didn't know what you were going to do at the beginning, then it's very hard to come back later and say what you have achieved. So the idea of the theory of change is try to be very clear about what you want to achieve so that later on it can be easier also to know whether you have been successful or not. Okay? Uh, and this is a th the theory of change framework of the Green Climate Fund. Okay? No, no worries. I know it's a bit overwhelming this slide. We will come back to the different components. But basically, I suggest to start just to explain it okay, with the project activity. So we're going to develop some activities, and these activities are going to produce some results. Okay? By doing X, Y, and Z, we're going to achieve A, B, and C. Okay? And as a result, sorry for using the same expression, no? uh, as we, uh, with these results, we will obtain some outcomes. Okay? Maybe it's because I'm not a native English speaker. At the beginning, I found it challenging to distinguish between results and outcomes. In this context, and the GCF framework, I don't know if generally speaking, but result is more specific to the project. What you're going to achieve with this project, and then with this result, there, you know, there will be some outcomes. Some things are going to change beyond your project. So this is probably the best way of separating or differentiating results and, and outcomes. Okay? And the goal statement is like a 
the narrative of your project. No, if we do X, then this will happen because these are the, no, this is how this specific aspect goes. Okay, we'll see examples, don't worry about that. Okay, but also, when it comes to developing these activities, you need to identify some barriers and some risks that your project may face and to try to think of ways in order to overcome these uh, problems, these difficulties. And you need to, of course, state all the assumptions. No? In order to uh, present, in order to create this theory of change, we have assumed X, Y, C, and D, and we have this data that supports this. Okay, and you need to make, make this assumption explicitly. Okay, this is the, the final goal of what we're going to achieve. Okay, according to the uh, manuals of the Green Climate Fund, you need to follow a six step approach. Uh, reality is like a circle. Okay, it's not like you go from one to six and you stop, but uh, it's an iterative process. So you start by describing the problem. Okay, this is the problem that we are facing. Then you formulate the objective of your project. We plan on achieving this and that. You define the outcomes. We have already talked about them, and we will come back to this idea. Then you define the project results and activities, identify the barriers and risks, and then you align and adjust the, the theory of change. You know, as I said, it's an iterative process. Um, I think this is a little bit of thinking from the public sector, truth be told. You know, this is what the Green Climate Fund says we should do. We should start by describing the problem, in the real world, when I work with people who are preparing proposals for the Green Climate Fund, they start by thinking about the activities that they can develop. No, I, we can do this project, that, that project, and that project, and then you connect everything with an environmental problem and you justify the rest. So depending on what is your perspective, it might be easier to start with the description of the problem and to think, okay, what can we do to solve this problem? Or it might be easier, I think this is more likely the private sector perspective, to think about what are the ideas, no? what are the projects that we have in hand, and then to see how they are connected to problems that you know exist. Okay? But the theory or the manuals of the Green Climate Fund tell you that this is the steps that you have to follow, but it doesn't really matter. You can start with four and then come back to one. It's an iterative process. So uh, the first step is describing the problem. That's quite simple, no? You need to define what is the problem that you are dealing with using all the information, all the evidence that is available for you, and identifying the key audience no, that will be affected uh, by the project somehow. No? So the, if we are talking about, I don't know, a project that will reduce the vulnerability of our country uh, to climate change because of sea level rise, we need to explain what is the problem related with sea level rise in the country, how this can affect communities, how this can affect infrastructure, Okay, and we need to know who are the key audience that we really need to be working with. Okay, so that's an easy uh, way of starting dealing with this. So classical problems that you need to deal with. So um, you need to ask what is the problem statement. This is something that we will come back to the idea. No? But the problem is that due to climate change, sea level rise is expected to increase by I don't know how many millimeters. And due to that, you know, the problem will face risk A, B, and C. What uh, is the evidence of the problem? So in this case, well, the evidence is that there are some uh, projections conducted by international scientists that say, da, 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 and we are already seeing in the country that sea level is rising, okay? What factors contribute to the problem? Well, probably our urban planning is not working well and we are building infrastructure very close to the, to the sea, probably, or maybe, no, we are not taking we are not protecting our uh, ecosystems, which could be uh, no, helping us in order to deal with this problem. You need to focus on the causes and also what will be the consequences. No? So if we do not act, this will create a problem for people, will create a problem for ecosystems, and will create a problem for our economic system, infrastructure, services, and so on. Okay? Just talking about the example of sea level rise, but it can be used to, obviously to any type of, of problem. Okay, you have here an example, <laughs> yeah, the, which is precisely you no know, sea level rise, and uh, the solution, for example, is to implement methods related to coastal resilience. No, we're going to implement some nature-based solutions or whatever in order to be better protected against sea level rise, because that's something that, as a country, you cannot do anything to prevent sea level rise. Maybe globally, you know, the international community can still do something, but we, as a country, we don't have the capacity. Even if we reduce all our emissions to zero, we will still have to face sea level rise, so that's not the problem that you can solve. 
Okay, so you can find solutions in order to mitigate it, but you are not. Uh, you, you cannot. Um, you cannot solve the problem of sea level rise globally because you are affected by what happens in other places. Okay. Um, the second is the objective, okay, and we go back to this famous uh, way of making statements that the GCF requires, okay, the if, then, because, okay. So basically what you are trying to summarize here is we have seen what is the problem that we are try trying to deal with. And you need to understand what are the, as we saw, the causes and consequences so that we know that if we act and we are able to move the needle in one specific factor that is relevant, then we will be able to reduce the problem because we have seen that they are connected. No? So this is a way in order to present uh, a narrative for one specific problem that we are dealing with. Okay? It should be aligned with the idea of paradigm shift. We have already seen that now when we were talking about the evaluating criteria for the project ETS, which is how, uh, no, whether this project can be a scale up and whether this project can really change the way we are understanding things, can really make an important contribution to change. Okay, here we, you have one example of, um, um, of this narrative. No? So if we implement comprehensive coastal resilient measures, then we can protect vulnerable coastal communities from the adverse effect of rising sea level rise because these measures will reduce the risk of coastal erosion, property change, and potential displacements of residents, ultimately ensuring their safety and preserving their livelihood. This is a way of formulating the objective for our intervention. Okay? Before that, we need to think about the problem, the causes and consequences, but this is how we should present the problem so that the, the agency who is going to receive this has a comprehensive explanation of what we plan to achieve, okay? And this, it seems very easy, but uh, you need to understand that then it will be uh, how you will be evaluated, no? Whether you have achieved this, you, no? you are saying a lot of things here. It's not uh, just a general narrative. You are saying specifically what you want to do and uh, what are the objectives of your intervention. Then the outcomes, no? if you remember, we had the activities, the results, and the outcomes. So the outcomes are like, let's say, the components or the building blocks that, if we achieve, will make us uh, you know, achieve the objective that we have already been talking about that. No? So we have, as I said, no, we have specific activities. With these activities, we will achieve some results very close to these activities. And from a, so from a country perspective or from a social perspective, this will allow us to reach some outcomes, okay? We will see that in a minute with some examples. Um, so, uh, well, yes, in this case, no, the idea is that you need to identify because there are many assumptions that are related to your outcome. So we, achieve, we say that we're going to uh, meet this outcome because we have assumed X, Y, and Z, and something very important is you, you identify all the different assumptions that you have made. No? Like if you were writing a scientific paper or something like that, you need to specify and detail all your, all your assumptions, okay? And one example of outcomes is uh, integrated climate information and early warning systems able to instantly inform public to facilitate quick evaluation and protective action. So as a result of some actions that we will undertake, there will be some results and the outcome, what we really want to achieve and that will allow us to meet the goal is uh, to, to achieve this, no? an integrated climate information and early warning system. Okay, and the assumption that we have made is, of course, that we have resources availability, uh, available. No? So we have technology, we have materials. So this is why we believe this outcome will be achieved. Okay? We'll then see an example of a project so that you can uh, connect all the different dots. No? Because if you explain this in an isolated way, it seems like a complicated thing to, to do. Then the results, which are the change that occurs at, at direct result of the activities undertaken, okay? So as we were seeing, no, that you have conducted some activities and you obtain some results, okay? So I think we have, well, and these are the activities, which are the, the things that you're going to do, no? the actions that you uh, want to implement. So you need to specify what activities must be completed in order to, re to obtain this outcome and also to arrange the activities in a lo logical sequence, which is very relevant. No? Not, we need to understand what happens if you implement this action, what happens if you implement that action, and what is the order in what you're going to do that. Okay? So one example of project result, and we're following the same example, is 
improved observations and monitoring of long-term sea level, okay? So if we are able to have improved observation and monitoring of long-term sea level, the outcome that we will achieve, as you have seen before, is those early warning systems and improved meteorological alert systems, okay? So this is how it, how it goes. Uh, then the barriers and risks. I think this is something that it's more common sense, no? It's very logical thing to do. Okay, um, there are, oh, sorry, there are some barriers that may affect how effective and how efficient we are in dealing with this specific problem, okay? So you need to identify these risks. If you don't do that, someone might think that you haven't taken them into account and that you know, your proposal will not be successful. So it's very good that you identify those risks and you try to think about how to mitigate them, okay? Some, there are many different types of barriers that can be linked to a specific project. We have ecological barriers, for example. No? We have, because of the geography of our country or because of uh, hydrological things, there are things that we cannot do. Obviously, financial barriers, you know them very well, no? And in all the interviews that we've had with you, this is something that has come up regularly. Uh, there are also gender barriers because of gender inequalities that can, have an, can affect, no? Whether our project is effective or not, and also institutional barriers, no? There are some regulations or practices that even if, no, I want to implement or focus on renewable energy, but if the government is funding fossil fuels, but maybe it's a bit more complicated. So there are things that we also need to, to address. More specific when it comes to regulation, whether, no, I plan to do that, but it's forbidden by law, or the law does, is gonna make it very complicated. Also social issues that might be affected, and you need to take into account ethnicity, race, religion, gender, and many different variables you know, that, can be, that, can be, that can have an influence, and also technological barriers. You, know? you plan to do that, but this technology hasn't been proven in that particular region, so you will find it very challenging to really implement that. You know? One example, uh, going back to the idea of meteorological systems, can be insufficient skill to implement solutions. Okay, and the risk is that limited budget arrangement to operate the introduced system. So you can implement the best alert system in the world, but if you don't have the resources or skills, this might obviously affect the, you know, how effective you are with this action. This is something that you, you will need to uh, work on. And then the step number six, if you remember, is like connecting everything together, you know? connecting the outcomes, project results, and project activities, you know? and to do an, some iteration. So this is... Uh, you know, in a graphical way, all the different elements, you know, goal, outcomes, project result, project activities, barriers, and assumptions. And we're gonna see this with one specific example. Okay, so you can see how it can be presented. This is an example of an action in the Maldives. Uh, and it's, uh, the, it's a project related to climate change adaptation. Okay, so the title of the intervention is Building Climate Resilient Safer Islands in the Maldives. And uh, the theme is adaptation, no? And uh, the idea is to address most vulnerable people, communities and region infrastructure and built environment and ecosystem services, no? That might be affected by, by climate change, okay? So it's a very comprehensive project that includes many aspects related to uh, climate change in the country from many different perspectives, okay? We'll have a look at it. The problem, the main problem that this project is addressing following the steps no, of, the, of the Green Climate Fund is coastal erosion. And the solution, we'll come back to this, is natural resilience of beach and coral reef. Okay, this is how we plan to solve the problem of coastal erosion by using this natural resilience of beaches and, and coral reef. So this is what's very hard to read. No, it's quite a small here, but this is the whole framework of this specific project, the whole theory of change explained. And I think it's then on the different slides, we have it face by face. No? So for example, the goal statement, if proper coastal management is realized and some beaches are improved by coastal measures, then loss of the national land is alleviated and safe and livelihoods is secure because natural resilience of beach and coral reef are maintained and residence awareness and action for coastal conservation are enhanced. Okay, so this is the goal statement, the narrative, no? where we summarize all the different aspects. Okay? Um, the outcomes that we want to achieve are a strengthened institutional and regulatory framework for climate responsive coastal zone management, and uh, outcome number two, reduced exposure to coastal erosion for communities and infrastructure, and number three, 
integrated climate information and early warning systems. Okay, those are the three outcomes that are obtained as a result, as a consequence of the project results. Okay, which are very, it's very similar. As I said, sometimes it's a little bit of a very subtle to tell the difference between results and outcome. But results are more project specific. No? So institutional capacity building and policy support protection of coastal communities, strengthened multi-hazard early warning systems, and improved observations, okay? And to obtain these results, we need to think of some activities, okay? And here you have the array of activities that has been uh, prepared, and these activities are normally organized in components, okay? So here you have the different components of the project, no? which are number, from number one to four, from number two to 2.3, three, and activity four, one, four, one, and 4.2. So here you have the different actions that will be undertaken in this project that will give you these results so that we achieve these outcomes so that we can fulfill this goal statement, okay? I know it's um, a little bit of a terminological thing, but I think it's really, it's really important, okay? Uh, these are the risks that were identified in this case, no? in this example, so risk number one, communities and governors do not respond to intervention promoting behavioral change. What happens if they do not respond? Uh, then the expertise on coastal zone management is not expanded to other relevant agencies, so we, don't, we are not able to scale this up. Uh, then inability and less budget. Then extreme event no, that um, affect what we are doing or less budget arrangement to operate the systems, okay? Those are risks that can really uh, Geopardy the, the, you know, what we were trying to achieve. And there are also some barriers. They can say, okay, lack of regulatory system, insufficient technical expertise, and insufficient skills. Okay, so those are the barriers that we have identified. And then some assumptions that are um, the basis for what you are saying. No? And we say, we have assumed to formulate all this theory of change that the government is willing to promote the concept of coastal zone management, that it's committed to long-term maintenance, blah, blah, blah. Those are the assumptions that you have made no, in order to keep all this theory of change in place. Okay. Um, your turn, Mentimeter. <laughs> and I guess, Jocelyn, that we can do the Mentimeter and probably Telly? And after the Mentimeter, I guess we can yeah. take a break and go to, uh, for lunch. Yeah, we'll have lunch and I can. Okay. Okay, so um, I will also ask you to um, access again to dementi.com uh, and um, scan this code or include the number code. Um, I will. Today, you know, the gods of information. Let's see, would see inputs. Is that the same thing as activities? Because I realize that if you if you were to if you were to Google the theory of change and and get you know basic templates, you would see the language changes oh, yeah. from template to template. Yeah. So so um, I've seen well, I've done one, but but there wasn't any input for there wasn't any provision called activities instead it was called input so I'm just wondering okay. if it might be the same thing it sounded to be the same thing where there was activities mm. instead of input I don't, I don't think so I mean I uh, as you said no um, the theory of change is not something that you can there is not a book on theory of change that can be applied to any institution so it's just a general logical framework no and uh, what we have seen here is how the green climate fund uses the theory of change and how it requests you to send proposals, no? So uh, he, here we talk about activities. So I don't know, uh, you were mentioning inputs, I don't know what is uh, understood as inputs in other templates that you have found, but to me it seems like it's different, no? The input side is what is required in order to conduct an activity, I would say, without knowing the specific uh, source of, of that, no? but I understand that in order to produce, uh, to undertake an activity, you need some inputs. So, for example, if you're going to install, I don't know, um, photovoltaic panels, I guess you need some input. No? You need uh, the panels, you need uh, grid, you need experts. 
I would say that it's not the same input as activity, but um, uh, as I say, I'm a little bit, I don't know what is the source of that. So strictly speaking, this is the recommended template that yeah. the GCF wants? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, okay, absolutely. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The logical model is a more material approach, no? Yes, Whereas, yes, yes. Yes. They look very similar, but there are certain subtle differences yeah. as you move into the You start with the tier chain and then you build your logic model or your logical yeah. framework. And they look similar, but there are some, you know, very important differences. The theory of change is more fun. I mean, the, <laughs> no, the old logical framework, logical model, was so boring, so many stuff that you had to do it in an Excel sheet that was like that. Yeah, this is better. There was a question there? Hi, good day. My name is Danny Atherton. Um, sometimes interchangeable is the word deliverables for the activities mm -hmm. in the logical framework. In the LFA, it's, it's sometimes deliverables. Refer. The deliverables are normally your outputs. Well, you know, that is what you're delivering hmm. as a result of the activities, and oftentimes we confuse it. You know, um, so I've done projects, for example, where there's a lot of focus on activities. Um, I did a project now in Jamaica. There's a lot of focus on activities, but we ain't getting any outputs. Hmm. There are no deliverables. As a result of the activities, yes. Components, sometimes you have a, it depends, there are different um, things that are used. The, the Canadian LFA, um, sometimes you have um, work, when you do the work breakdown structure, right. which gives you um, the components. You, you do the work breakdown structure from the outputs, right? Yes. Yeah, you do that and then you, you break it down. Into but the word you, you, we are using in this in this particular one is activities. This here? This is what we are using here, or input. Um, the lady suggested input, but what was the word that we had? As using your, activities. Activities, right, yes. Using activities, right. Okay. But this is not the work. This is just, this is a high level tier of change. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. a very high level tier of change. When we want to, to break it down further, now we take the outputs I mean, break it down okay, into okay. breakdown structures and so on. Components, yeah. subcomponents. Yeah, right, correct. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. yeah the, the term deliverable, it's very usual in consultancy. No? I'm a consultant, so we're talking about deliverables all the time. But this is, as Michael was saying, this is more a high-level approach to a project. No? So I don't think the term deliverable makes so much sense in this regard. The tier of change is among the first things you do when you conceptualize your project, you know. You start with the theory of change, and then you move down, and you develop the logic model, the logical framework. And as you implement the project, then you work your work breakdown structure. The work breakdown structure is not really done at this level. It's done at the implementation level. Yeah. Okay. Jocelyn? So what you, what you spoke about there was uh, benefits to the public, right? Public benefits. And that's easy for the government to do because our job is to look out for the public interest. Uh, but because we're dealing with private businesses, um, some of them may be concerned, uh, maybe concerned is not the word, but interested in how these projects can benefit the country while also impacting their businesses. I, I hope I'm not incorrect with that, but 
uh, when I read some of the, the, the profiles, the proposals that were submitted, uh, some of them were clearly focused on the country impact. And some of them you could tell, some of the smaller scale ones, was a benefit to the business, but also a benefit to the country. And I, I don't think you could um, ignore that. You're dealing with the private sector. Um, so in the theory of change, would it be appropriate? I, I guess this is a high level uh, theory of change, so you may, you may not want to put in there, my, my business will also benefit, etc. Yeah. Would that be appropriate? <laughs> For the theory of change. To talk about the benefits of a specific industry, for example, you mean? Yes. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, this is, I mean, that uh, a project has positive economic consequences, that is obviously good, and this is something that you know, is relevant for the Green Climate Fund or for the institutions who will be evaluating the project. But uh, as we said before, before the break, um, you need to keep a broader scope, no? and uh, you need to focus on the aggregated impact of, of your action. If this proposal is going to create employment, is going to create economic activity, is going to improve I don't know, the salaries in one specific region, that's something that you can mention, but this shouldn't be the focus of the proposal, because the proposal should be focused on the, uh, let's say, social and environmental impacts of your project. So you need to combine it, but it will not be the, no, the most crucial parameter. Right, you may want to probably create a thing where you have, you know, a grouping of viable, economically viable private sector enterprises investing in climate matters. But in terms of profitability and so on, that becomes an assumption to assume that the project in the pipeline mm -hmm. is, is commercially viable. Oh, yeah. You know, so you, you probably find a way. Not in the, it wouldn't be a, a goal. It wouldn't be an outcome. But somewhere, probably in, in the assumption, you could find a way to stick it in somewhere there, right? But it, in the goal, that I agree with you. You want a broader effect on the, you know, hmm. on, on country. Yeah. Makes sense. You still have the challenges over there? No, just sleeping. That's oh, all. Sleep, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah, let's continue with the Mentimeter. I know if you have been able to scan. Jocelyn, I don't know if they did, they did have time to scan or to go to introduce the, to the code. Oh, 21, okay, okay, very good, yeah. I didn't see it, so yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you can see the screen, but there are three options. Theory of change is used to calculate the financial resources needed for climate projects. Option B, it is used to describe and illustrate how and why change is expected to co occur in the project. And C, it is used to identify the opportunities of the project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I told Jocelyn when she showed me the the answers that I always tell to my students in case of doubt choose the longest answer because normally it's the correct one, no? Because you explain a little bit more things and normally as here the <laughs> longest answer is the right one. Yeah. No? If you have A B C D choose the longest. Yeah. Okay, so correct. No, I mean it's Obviously, you know, uh, using the theory of change, you can identify the opportunities of the project somehow in a very general sense. You don't talk about financial resources because this is more a broader, high-level approach. And yeah, it's used to describe you know, how and why change is expected to occur in the, in the price. So yeah, that was the right, the right answer. Okay, and now what do you think the theory of change is not useful for? Uh, a is better planning and evaluation, B is mitigating risks, C is better planning and evaluation again, and D is elaborate a budget.
everything under control. Very good. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, very good. Do you have enough prizes to give to the class? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't brought any. Lunch, in lunch, we will give you food <laughs> and water. <laughs> okay, uh, what is paradigm shift? And A describes how the beneficiary country takes ownership of and implements the funded project. B, it is defined as the degree to which the proposed activity can catalyze impact beyond a one-off project investment. You are following my rule, not the longest one. <laughs> okay. So the right answer is? The town, <laughs> very good. Okay, so yeah, you are all passing with flying colors. Okay, and that's it. So, Telly, and as you tell me otherwise, I think it's time for lunch. Yeah. No, it's 1 p.m. Uh, we continue at, I don't have the agenda with me. How long do we have? We have uh, one hour. One hour, one hour. okay, so we'll continue at 2 p.m. Thanks a lot.
and here basically this is an assessment um, to the identification, management, and assessment of the environmental and social impacts and risks that can be um, as a result of the implementation of a project. And we also have the environmental and social safeguards, and in this case, basically, are the policies, procedures, or guidance um, that show you how to really manage uh, the potential impacts that can be shown uh, when implementing a GCF project. So these are some of the um, key concepts uh, related to the environmental social safeguards. And it is also important to know that GCF has uh, several policies, including the environmental social policies. Um, this was a policy created in 2018, and basically this policy states um, how the entities um, that are going to implement the projects or the accredited entities must uh, follow some uh, assessment and steps in order to manage um, correctly the um, social environmental impacts. So um, this policy have um, basically three scopes. Um, they have um, the scope related to the strategic and institutional um, scope, the accredited entities scope, and the activity scope. Um, it is important to mention that the uh, accredited entities are the responsible to make this um, environmental and social assessment of all the projects that are going to be financed by the GCF. Um, however, it is important uh, for the um, people that are going to be implementing the projects to know that um, the implementation of the project can um, result in several um, environmental and social impacts. So it is important that we can assess them and implement some mitigation measures in order to avoid this risk. Um, so I would like to focus on the activity scope so basically, this um, UCF environmental and social policies establishes the requirements for environmental and social risk assessment. So um, in this policy, it is established what are the steps in order to make a due diligence related to the environmental and social assessments. Um, so. Um, the GCF has adopted um, these performance standards related to the international finance um, corporations, and basically there are eight performance standards that is important for us to know in order to correctly assess the environmental and social impacts of the GCF or other projects. So uh, we have the first one, the assessment and management of environmental and social risks and impacts. So basically, this um, standard states that all companies and implemented entities must have an environmental and social management system in order to um, first identify what are the potential environmental and social impacts that a project can have, and then um, how to assess them, and finally how to um, implement some action plan in order to mitigate those impacts. So um, they make some recommendations on how to identify these risks, and also, of course, how to uh, make some engagement or consultancies so that potential stakeholders um, can engage with this uh, project and avoid this type of um, environmental social impacts. Okay, so this is the, the first performance standard. The second one is related to labor and working conditions. So um, the entities or organizations that are going to implement some project are, um, must consider um, that the workers have fair treatment, that there is no discrimination, and um, it is better if they have equal opportunity in their labor um, job or, or conditions. They also uh, must comply with the employment of or labor uh, laws that could be applied in the, um, the, on the project. And also, uh, the companies must try to um, protect their workers, uh, avoid discrimination, and have equal treatment or equal opportunity. 
So this is um, the second performance standard. Um, the third one is related to um, that the entities must um, improve or avoid um, the pollution um, in the environment that can be um, as a result of the implementation of the project, and of course try to um, uh, to uh, improve the efficiency of the use of the different natural resources. Um, the third one is related to the community health, safety, and security. And the companies must try to anticipate and avoid those impacts related to the health of the, uh, in the first place, the workers, and also the health of the um, biodiversity, the environment, and also the people that are, are going to be around or in the project. So they, um, they must include some standards in order to avoid some impacts in their health. Also, um, they have to provide um, some safe work related to the people that are going to um, participate or work in the project. Um, the uh, next one is related to land acquisition and involuntary resettlement. So organizations must try to avoid uh, moving people from their places, avoid resettlements, and in case that um, the project must um, have to, to make some resettlements, they must try to give the best condition of the people in terms of livelihood. So um, they must have a, an action plan in order to make these resettlements. Um, the next one is related to biodiversity convert conservation and sustainable management of living. Of course, in <laughs> any projects can be uh, or can have um, impacts related to the biodiversity. Um, in this case, organization must try to avoid this type of impacts or um, implement some mitigation measures in order to um, decrease the impacts um, that the project can have in terms of biodiversity. Uh, the next one is related to indigenous people. Um, some projects can involve the participation of these um, um, vulnerable communities. And in this case, um, the project must ensure the full respect for indigenous people. They also uh, would like to include them in the consultations, every consultations, and of course, um, as in the free, prior, and informed concept related to the uh, implementation of this project. So it is important to consider also if there are any communities that can be vulnerable for the implementation of this project. Okay, and the last one is the cultural heritage. And of course, in the uh, implementation of the project, it's important to protect and preserve any of the cultural heritage. So um, it is important to make some assessment. Is there any um, cultural patrimony that is going to be affected by the implementation of the project? And in case that it is um, like that, it's important to um, protect and preserve this cultural heritage and also to promote equitable sharing of cultural heritage benefits. So these are some of the performance standards that the GCF consider in order to make this um, environmental or social assessment of the um, project that is going to be financed by the fund. So um, just to remember, the accredited entities are the responsible of doing this um, assessment, this due diligence related to the environmental social um, impacts of the project. However, it's important for us to know that this is a type of assessment that is really important in order to th implement the projects. So um, these are the performance standards that is going to be considered in this type of assessment. And I would also like to talk about some of the GCF responsibility um, related to the environmental and social assessment. First, um, it is important that the GCF um, manage um, the different type of environmental and social risks that can be um, can present in the GCF um, activities financing. Um, it is also, as I mentioned, 
um, the GCF must require and ensure that the accredited entities must carry on this type of um, assessment. The accredited entity must implement, screen, and categorize all the activities related to um, what are the risks and impacts that can be as a result of the implementation of these projects. And of course, um, they have to monitor um, the implementation of the action plans and the mitigation measures in case there is any um, impact or risk. Um, I would also like to talk about the environmental and social risk screening. This is a preliminary assessment um, when implementing an, a, a project and um, the objective of this um, screening is to, of course, identify and analyze if there is any environmental and social risk and if any is important to um, categorize um, how, um, what is going to be the impact and how much is going to be that impact. Um, the GCF has three types of categories and we will see it in the next slide, but it's important to assign an environmental social category risk. And finally, of course, it's important to include um, some mitigation measures in case there is any environmental social risk. So um, um, basically, this environmental social screening is a desktop um, work, and you will need some information. In any of this, um, it is important to know what is going to be the scope of the activities in order to uh, you let you know um, what are going to be these environmental social impacts. You're also going to need to know what um, is the location where the project is going to be implemented, if, if there is going to be any um, indigenous people or is going to be any affection in the biodiversity. So it is important to know um, where is the project going to be implemented. Also, it is important to um, identify um, if there is going to be any use of technology or intervention of the project, um, if the project is going to require some construction or implementation, for example, like solar panels, and they have to uh, make some arrangement, implementation that can affect uh, people around or um, the biodiversity. So it's important also to consider the intervention and technologies that will going to be used in, in the project. Also, it's important to consider, for example, what are the inherent risks related to um, the type of sector or activities that is going to be associated. Um, also, it is important to consider previous stakeholder consultations or previous environmental social assessment in order for you to um, make a preliminary assessment of what are going to be the environmental social impacts. Um, also, as I mentioned, basically this environmental social screening is a desktop um, job and you will need um, a preliminary information. You can have this type of information um, in academic journals, books, um, information of environmental organizations, um, of course, um, some reports or previous assessment related to the evaluation of the environmental social impacts. So here you can have um, some information on what can be the potential environmental and social risk and impacts. Um, the GCF has um, like a toolkit on which are the potential questions that you could evaluate in order to identify which are going to be the affections or the impacts related to the implementation of the project. And it is organized based on the um, ninth performance standard of the IFC. So here, as you can see, the first one is related to the assessment and management of environmental and social risk and impacts. Um, some questions related to identify if there is any risk or impact related to the labor and working conditions. For example, a question that could be helpful in order for you to identify this type of impacts is um, are the activities are likely to affect working conditions, particularly in terms of employment, compliance with labor laws, um, 
um, equal opportunity? Is there any child labor or forced labor of direct contract or third party workers? You also have some questions related or to assess if there is any um, impacts related to pollution or the use of resources. For example, a, a question to identify if this type of impact can be are activities like to use natural resources including water or energy. Um, so these questions can be uh, really helpful for you in order to identify um, preliminary impacts or risk. Um, you also have questions related to community health, safety and security, if there is any land acquisition or involuntary resettlement, um, questions related to the biodiversity conservation, indigenous people, and cultural heritage. So um, this is a, um, a very helpful toolkit for you. Um, you. You don't have to be an expert in terms of um, making environmental social assessment. So this could be uh, very helpful in order for you to identify this type of impacts. This is not a, um, obligatory to use, but um, GCF recommends um, the implementation entities to make this type of assessment. So in your tables, you are going to have these um, sheets and you could find this type of um, question for the nine performance standard. And that will be useful for the next um, activity that we are going to, to make. So um, you have this tool that will be helpful for you to make this type of assessment. And um, the, the after you make this type of assessment, this is environmental social screening, it's important that you can identify what is the category risk of the project. So the GCF have three types of a category. Um, it has um, the high risk, moderate risk, and low risk in terms of environmental social impacts. So. Um, a activity or a project can be considered as a higher risk if there is, a, if there is any activities that can be um, irreversible, diverse, or unprecedented, significant, adverse, and they also have environmental, social risk, and impacts. Um, some project or activities can be considered to have moderate environmental social risk in case that the activities have limited potential adverse um, environmental social risk, but it can be um, addressed by the implementation of mitigation measures. And an um, activity can, can be considered to have a low environmental uh, and social risk if the activities have no or minimal environmental and social impacts. So these are the three categories um, that are considered by the GCF in terms of environmental and social risk. And um, here are some examples that uh, have been already approved by the GCF. So for example, some projects or activities that are considered to have a higher risk uh, in terms of environmental and social impacts are, for example, um, large infrastructure, for example, large-scale coastal defenses, uh, municipal solid waste treatment, um, infrastructure projects, including the, the development of ports, airports, highways, railroads. Um, also, an example of a higher risk is a urine flood management project. So these all are, um, yeah, do you have any questions? Environmental risk as it relates to what the GCF wants. Usually in countries like ours, the environmental risks is governed by the local law. For example, if you want to do an EIA to build a hotel or something like that and decide you're going to do an environmental risk assessment uh, or environmental impact assessment, you'll have to get somebody who is guided by the local legislation and so on and so forth. I'm beginning to think that in some cases that legislation might be irrelevant because it is way below what is being asked there. Yeah. How can one <laughs> argue their way? I, I'm thinking that somebody will say, well, okay, I'm using the local law. That's what guides me. Ministry of the Environment will say, yeah, that's what we have. It, I'm beginning to think that that could be relevant. 
considering the requirements that are there. I don't know if you want to speak to that or, or in from where you sit, because um, I'm not sure if there is anybody here from the Department um, Ministry of the Environment or, or, or so on to speak to that, because this is quite a high level. Yeah. And we are still operating at a level where we have, we may not even have the local expertise to do the appropriate risk assessment for us to ensure it complies, by, complies to the GCF requirements. I don't even want to speak to that. Yeah, and that is a common problem in some of the countries, and that's why um, the GCF um, asks the countries, of course, to align with the national laws. However, um, it can be uh, lower than what the GCF expects. So that's why the GCF has um, adopted these uh, performance standards. So um, in, in reality, these ones, um, these ones, for example, biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable management of living. Um, so the GCF have adopted these um, standards, performance standards. And the evaluation of the environmental and social um, risk assessment has to be aligned with these performance and standard. These are the ones from the um, International Finance Corporation. So they have a manual on what is going to be the assessment, how to be structured this type of assessment, so the entities must um, follow this performance and standard in order to comply with the GCF requirements. Although it can be more strict than uh, what the national laws uh, have considered. So um, this is uh, a very good guideline in order to assess this type of impacts. I don't know if, and if there is any more questions. No. Okay. Um, so let me. Okay. Um, another example of um, projects that can be uh, or can have medium. Um, Environmental social risk are, for example, the implementation of energy efficiency and renewable energy, for example, solar panels, um, the implementation of low emissions transportation, um, forestry management, or the um, activities related to improve the resilience of vulnerability communities. Um, um, you can also have projects that have a low um, environmental social risk, and basically these are activities related to capacity building, um, making some um, policies or regulations, um, technical services, implementation of early warning systems, uh, smallholder productions, and community-based conservation. So these are some of the examples of projects that can have a low environmental social um, risk. So um, I would like to also make um, so this activity in the Mentimeter. So um, please, if you can access to this, um, uh, the menti.com and include this code or scan the QR. Um, just let me uh, put it in the computer. Okay, so um, um, you can access to this, to the, I'm sorry. Um, okay, the um, www.menti.com and you can enter this code or scan the QR code. So we have already um, eight people. Okay.
Okay, we have already 13 people. Is there anyone more logging to the Menti? So we can wait or we can start. Okay, so I think we can start. Um, so the first question, oh, we have already some answers. Um, what categories do the GCF environmental and social safeguards include? Um, cost effective, um, land acquisition and environmental resettlement, um, biodiversity, and indigenous people. So this um, question is more related to what are the IFC performance standards. Remember that we have nine, so which of these are the these performance standards adopted by the GCF? Um, Telly, I don't know if you can uh, please enter, please, so we can show the correct answer. So, um, as many of you vote, uh, the I IFC performance standards are related to land acquisition and voluntary resettlement, the indigenous people, and biodiversity. So, the next question is, uh, which of the following example can be um, categorized as a category activity A, or a high risk uh, in terms of environmental and social impacts? So many have voted for large scale coastal defenses. Okay, people are still voting. Okay, um, Tali, could you help press and enter? Okay, so um, you have here a large scale coastal defenses. So basically, um, the projects that conceive of uh, implementing or construction large um, infrastructure uh, are considered in general to have a high risk of, in terms of environmental and social impacts. So um, these are all the questions. Um, I think. Okay, I don't know if. Uh, yeah, you should. Click here. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is any question before we get to the practical session. It's going to be um, some activity. I hope you like it. But before we start, I don't know if you have any questions or doubts related to this topic. Mm, is that all clear? Now is the time because you are going to ha make um, some activity related to that. So now is the time to make some questions. No? Okay, so um, I will ask you to make some groups. Um, you can um, join with the other table. Um, I would like to have four groups. So please, you can join groups. Um, and I will give you some um, sheets and instruments where you can have the activity. So please join groups.
project for sustainable city looks into the issues of uh, transformative urban mobility intervention. Without the GCF financing, this project would not happen due to the number of barriers. GCF is providing a uh, sufficient layer of uh, very affordable concessional financing that could actually help reduce the barriers to much faster uptake of uh, electric vehicles in public transportation. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to shift uh, modality of transportation from public, private car, car usage to public transportation by means of using electric vehicles. Meaning that we are actually trying to intervene with providing e-buses and electric vehicles to public commercial fleets, uh, buses, taxis, and other public transportation so that the people could use more massively public transportation and therefore improving significantly the mitigation and resilience effect of climate intervention. Okay, um, so as you can see, um, one of the priority areas that GCF finance is um, the transport sector. So the GCF finances um, some projects that help um, countries to reduce the greenhouse gases emissions from the um, transport sector. So some of the activities that the GCA finance is, for example, the deployment of electric vehicles, implementation of electric infrastructure. Um, so this is an example of what GCA finance um, in this priority area. So um, I, what I have already given you uh, is um, a description of what type of project uh, we are going to evaluate or identify the potential environmental and social impacts. So um, basically, um, this project is, is related to the electric mobility program that is going to be implemented in Latin American and the Caribbean cities that targets or that objective is to um, implement sustainable urban development through measures that um, strengthen and improve the urban public transport and the quality of light in secondary cities. Um, so these programs finance basically electric buses, electric vehicle fleets, electric boats and vessels, and also supports the hydrogen projects and vehicle to grid projects for the urban mobility. So these are some of the activities or infrastructure that the, this program is going to be implemented. And um, this program focus on commercial immobility to support the significant model shift to private vehicles to various modes of public transport of electric vehicles. It also works to establish electric mobility frameworks, including, for example, gender action plans um, to promote transformative urban mobility that is resilient to climate change. So um, this program will not only implement um, this um, infrastructure or deploy this type of vehicles, but they will also have a component of technical assistance, as you will see in the next slides. So basically, the problem is that um, the transport sector is one of the sectors that have a, a lot of greenhouse gases emissions. So um, what the program um, seeks to uh, resolve is that um, the transport sector can have this transformative um, to um, being one of the most sectors that emits greenhouse gases emissions to um, a sector that can be uh, in, in a low development of greenhouse gases emissions. So the parentage shift potential of this project is going to be achieved by having a long-term outcome of an electric vehicle ecosystem which results in investors purchasing this type of um, transportation. Um, so, in these sheets that you have um, in your tables are the description of the different um, components.
So um, the first one basically um, is related to increased climate resilience of urban transport infrastructure. And this component, um, basically, the activities is going to be implementing cycle lines, pedestrian streets, and also providing infrastructure conditions to facilitate these alternative modes, electric uh, mobility, urban mobility, uh, parking and ride, and waiting areas. So the second component is related to implement pilot projects related to uh, vehicle to grid and hydrogen pilot projects. So um, this, this component focuses on the establishment of hydrogen production infrastructure, fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, filling stations, and equipment related to this type of pilot projects. Um, the third one is related to electrified integrated urban mobility and basically the goal of this component is to deploy these large scale fleets of public transportation, electric buses, um, um, different um, electric buses technologies and with different bus sizes. So um, this component will focus on deploying this type of um, electric vehicles. And finally, you have a four component related to technical assistance. So um, in this case, this component is associated with activities that provide technical assistance um, to enable effective financial assistance and to create um, some policies, for example, the gender assessment action plan. Um, so um, this is the fourth component. And um, what, what I'm going to um, ask you to do is to identify what are the potential environmental and social impacts that can be um, as a result of the implementation of this project. So um, I have identified some of the environmental social impacts that you can have, but you can put it um, more than this. So um, some of the environmental and social impacts can originate mainly of the construction of the proposed infrastructure. For example, these um, pedestrian cycle lanes, uh, they must require construction. So um, that could be some impacts associated to hazard of waste generation, also associated with the disposal of the batteries of the electric vehicles. Um, you can also have potential risks related to occupational health and safety activities. For example, the workers or the constructors that are going to be implemented these projects can um, suffer some of um, health or safety conditions related to the construction of this um, infrastructure or can have some potential ac accidents um, related to the production and storing of the hydrogen. Um, you can also have impacts um, when um, the constructing the IV chargers or the infrastructure for charging or hydrogen production. Um, it could also be impacts related to noise, uh, dust generation, solid or liquid waste, um, spillage, or also um, due to the construction of this uh, infrastructure can also be some um, traffic or alteration of the solids or alteration of the air quality. And um, so these are some other environmental and social impacts that can be a result of the implementation of this project. Okay, so here are the instructions um, you have in the sheets what I have just said. You have a description of all the components, um, what could be some environmental social impacts. So what I will ask you to do is to first um, write down some of the environmental and social impacts that you can identify for the implementation of this project. And um, then it is important um, that you could use this um, toolkit that you already have in your tables. Um, remember that you can um, make this assessment through these questions. These questions will guide you to identify what are the type of impacts um, related to the environment or social aspects. And then um, it is important that we only not um, identify these risks, but 
it is important for us to do something with this risk in order to avoid the impacts or mitigate these impacts. So it is important to also establish some mitigation measures. So uh, I will ask you to identify some environmental and social impacts and uh, for three of these impacts or risk, you could um, identify what are some mitigation measures that we can implement in order to avoid or reduce these impacts. Okay. Um, How long do we have? Okay. What time is it? I'm sorry. So m maybe 30 to 40 minutes? Yeah. Um, we can um, have 30 minutes, and then we, um, I will ask you, uh, a member of the group, to come here and present um, the results. Yeah, one suggestion is just a suggestion, but those two groups are very big, those two groups are small, so no, you are invited to come and join the smallest group so that no, you have more or less the same number of participants. Just a suggestion, but for you to consider. <laughs> okay, so you can start. If you have any questions or those, please uh, don't hesitate to ask me.
You have 15 more minutes. By now, you should have finished your screening and you should have started your action plan. 15 minutes to go.
You have seven minutes more. Correct?
<laughs> okay folks that's just about it just get ready to make your presentations Jocelyn will take over Thank you, Michael. Um, so I think they all of the groups are uh, finished with this activity. I don't know if, if there is any voluntary that want to come up here and present the impacts and the mitigation measures. Is there any voluntary? Okay, perfect, come on. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, um, here are our results from the assessment we did on the UV um, training program. Now, can't hold on. So we came up with a, an interesting thesis that the, the case study, um, our environmental assessment determined that um, we would need to have a disposal of batteries after the lifespan, whereas these batteries can still be recycled. Um, number two, we have a disposal of all of the old transportation buses and vehicles, again, where these vehicles can be um, retrofitted back into nitrogen because currently most vehicles are combustible and they can be converted to nitrogen so this is an option where um, all combustible vehicles can be converted to hydrogen vehicles. Um, oh no, our third one is again it's based on um, the work ethic now because um, the new conversion from the old vehicles being combustion to nitrogen would require training of uh, new infrastructure and the people. So here we have the education of our people because they would have to be trained to um, for the new areas of converting all of the old combustible vehicles over to hydrogen. And our second section, we have the summary of risks where um, we have the disposal of batteries was based on the mitigation measures is recycling. Again, because it's nitrogen, we have two options in terms of recycling on option on sorry. Options of recycling on nitrogen. Hydrogen, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Did they? <laughs> Forgive me, I'm nervous. Um, number two we have Again, the disposal of old vehicles because of the current condition and being combustible. Um, all vehicles can be converted from gas to hydrogen, again, as mentioned. And we have the lack of the skills on the island where um, new programs and initiatives will be created for scholarships, for training, um, investment such as um, hydrogen plants would have to be installed, um, hydrogen infrastructure, and then we also have to be aware that we would be moving from um, the current carbon industry over to hydrogen where that would be the biggest conversion, where, our, where of which could be an investment to the people because the people directly would, um, that this would increase work for the people in general. And this is all we came up with at the moment. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the first group. Um, 
I have a question. Could you repeat what was the second mitigation measure for the um, all vehicles? Oh, okay, perfect. It was perfect. Thank you to you all. Um, who want to come second to explain the impacts? Okay, come on, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am representing the group back there. And so after reviewing the case study, these are the environmental and social impacts that we would have determined to be most important. We first discussed the costs associated, associated with the change of electric vehicles. As we know in St. Kitts, we have a very robust public transport, transport system, but most of the buses here are privately owned, so we ha would have to convince these privately owned buses to switch over to electric vehicles and the costs, try to convince them that the costs associated with the switch over will be displaced once they don't, once they realize they wouldn't have to pay for gas. So that would be a big impact, is trying to get them to switch over. Uh, human error, this is referring to the maintenance of the electric vehicles, as you all know, that we do not currently have the expertise on island to maintain the vehicles if they break down, if they need parts replacing. <laughs> well, for the kind of change that we're looking at in the... Yes. As we currently in the case study, the it's not... It is present, but it is not at the state where we can say we want to replace the entire transport system. So as you can see, there is still a very big gap in the expertise needed and uh, what we want to implement. Infrastructure and location is another big impact because uh, we would now have to implement at least four charging stations all over the island. So that would involve evaluating the areas that they can be put, as well as uh, human settlement, and all of this is, uh, would be quite a big impact to input. Also, there's a high reliance on the grid currently. Well, switching over to EVs would put a high reliance on the grid because, uh, because we do not have the current infrastructure for solar power. That means all of these electric vehicles will be, sadly, have to be powered by uh, electricity. So that is going to put a high strain on the grid. Waste management, uh, that was one of the examples put, but currently we would, the, what do you call it? Solid waste, uh, there would have to be some training aspect involved in having them treat the disposal of battery vehicles. This, that is something that is very important and you cannot just throw them on the back of a dumpster and have them go up to they call it, can we dump? Um, <laughs> so there's also a lifestyle change because we would, have we would have discussed that these electric vehicles have to be charged at night. So if we're gonna say charge them at seven, that means you might not be able to catch a bus at seven o'clock in the evening. You might have to reschedule the way you move about. So that is going to be a pretty big change in your lifestyle, so that is another big impact. But all is not lost. We would have discussed that this is an opportunity to create employment in the country because, as she would have mentioned, the CFBC is working on their uh, training to, for electric vehicles. So there is a big opportunity to create employment on the island. So it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> so some of the risks that we would have laid out, uh, of course, the lack of human resources will lead to, will, uh, well, if the buses break down and there's no one to fix it, that means there's one less bus to transport people and that will lead to societal disruptions. But of course, the way to mitigate against that is training and education, which CFVC is going to provide. Uh, we also have health and safety concerns related to the placement of charging stations. 
we need more education as to the health related risks so not just putting on a charging station next to a project house or development and saying everything is fine so because we do not want 10 years down the line you're here having complications with people that are developing things the future of our nation so we need proper evaluations and assessments related to the placement as well as revising current laws for related to zoning and where these are going to be placed and relocation if necessary. So if you're going to put down a charging station and you need to relocate a housing development, then it has to be done. Uh, another risk is the grid may not be strong enough to support charging stations. So we can't put down four charging stations and expect Skelec to power all of it all the time. So we need to strengthen our natural resource natural energy resources, so that means investment in solar and wind energy, and then we can use a combination of those things to help power the, power the stations. And uh, also somebody would have mentioned that the buses, it could be that they run out of power before they reach an electronic, well, a charging station, so there is the potential, so just invest in portable chargers. That is all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, great work. Um, I don't know if Group 3 want to come up and share with you, with us, their thoughts. It's okay. You can come. <laughs> Okay. Um, just like the, uh, the first group, we identified the disposal of the batteries, which would be a negative impact. Um, the charging stations, the positioning and the use, where they will be positioned and how would they be used if um, too many vehicles go to um, charge at the same time, if it would have an issue with the population or, or some negative effects. Human resources to service the vehicles, which was already said. Um, displacement of people. Now, when we were discussing, uh, we reached to this part of displacement with people is, um, like we said, bef like she said before, um, they, in the case study, there are goals or options to build the bike lane, so that might take up more room. To get more room, they might have to expand the road. So to expand the road, you have to take up land, people's land. So then also the charging stations, where the charging stations, if charging stations are next to houses or have to be built where houses are, land will have to be used. People might lose their houses. So that's displacement of people, um, loss of income. If there are... Uh, Private bus, bus owners, that will be an issue to get them to convert to that. And limited access to transportation, which was just said about the timing of um, charging the vehicles versus transporting people. And the reduced revenue for government. In terms of... Huh? <laughs> because well, yes it is it is a, a negative side effect because um even though most of us don't like to pay taxes most of us we still do pay taxes and that helps with government doing what they have to do so that is a risk um now the mitigation measures we took three of those which were lack of human resources so what we the mitigation factor for that would be this would need to be a public and private sector initiative where government would work with private sectors to develop the industry, not just putting all the, the um, workload on government. The loss of income for the private bus owners, we, we suggest that government would incentivize private bus owners to get or uh, import the EVs. And the last one, which is the redu reduction in government re revenue. We 
would suggest that government balances how they tax the people or how they tax us. When, uh, if you give an incentive to bring in an uh, EV for the first implementation of the, the policy, afterwards when we have probably 50% or more, then we start to take back that and we start to tax you on it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you, great job. Um, can anyone of the last group come and share your thoughts? Please. All right, good afternoon to everyone. So the impacts, the negative impacts that we came up with. Um, first of all, cultural shift. Um, there will be some resistance to the idea of switching over to the EVs. Um, the creation and production of the necessary components, that's not readily available here. And you know, if you have to import batteries or any parts or anything like that, we, don't, we are not state to state like the US, so you can't overnight it. You have to deal with freight and overseas transport. Disposal of the batteries and the electronic parts, um, currently we do not, we are not equipped to dispose, uh, solid waste is not equipped to dispose of these items. Um, job displacement of the traditional automotive industries, for example, the bus drivers, as someone mentioned before, all of the buses are independently owned and privately owned, um, so you would not need all of the bus drivers once this initiative kicks in. Also, the gas stations. You are now increasing the use of electric vehicles and reducing the use of the gasoline for regular vehicles. Um, in that regard, then you have stress on the grid, which was mentioned before. So, you know, you might have a, a double-edged sword there where you're saving on electricity uh, on the carbon emissions, but then you still have to use the carbon emissions because you're pumping um, diesel from the generators to generate, to support these, these vehicles. Infrastructural changes for the new technologies of the vehicles, um, we don't have those in place. Affordability of the maintenance of these vehicles, um, you might ask the individual driver, say, hey, um, you get a an EV, now it's time for you to maintain it long term. Um, what's the cost of ownership in that regard? Also, the affordability from a consumer standpoint. Um, currently, you pay X amount to travel from point A to point B. Um, over a period of time, is that cost going to weigh out? The summary of the risks and mitigation measures, you have the cultural shift out in non-acceptance. There has to be an educational campaign. Um, a pilot program would be um, one that we could implement so that we can run that educational campaign and show the results of such. Um, the sourcing of products, the product component and sourcing of such policy creation um, from the government side um, where we can actually encourage collaborations, where we can get these items either in quickly or a factory on the ground with the capabilities of producing these items. Because the last thing you want is bus breakdown with people and you can't get it fixed until next two months because you got to import it from Europe or something like that. Disposal, um, disposal of the batteries, etc., and components. Again, education, training specifically for the, the solid waste and their team and policies put in place regard, with regards to the management of the disposal processes, the networks, and the safety. Because when it comes to disposing of any lithium batteries or electrical um, components, they have significantly higher voltages. So we have to be cognizant of those aspects and be able to prepare for them. 
um, job displacement of the traditional bus drivers, of course we can utilize them in other aspects, retrain them to do different things within the EV components. Um, power grid as issue, um, incorporate renewable sources. Um, we have geothermal here, we have um, the sun, so um, we can capitalize on those to power the additional stress to the grid. Maintenance, um, it's all about training. You have to train um, not just your people in the government, but you also have to train owners um, about maintenance and maintenance um, culture. Consumer affordability, if, if we are encouraging, um, let's say, private individuals to have these electric vehicles, uh, will they be uh, affordable? So those subsidies would have to be put in place by the government, uh, make a way for them to be able to afford them um, on a day-to-day -day basis whereby they could actually earn a living using it. And that's us. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to congratulate you all because I think you have done a great work, so congratulations. <laughs> you have done a great job. Uh, what I would like to, um, for this session, to learn you is that it's important to identify these negative potential impacts from projects that although um, could have um, positive impacts, for example, the transportation, um, electric vehicles, and implementation of this infrastructure, you can also have negative impacts. And it is also important to identify these impacts and um, implement some mitigation measures so the project can be successful and have uh, potential um, positive benefits. So this is why it is important to make this type of assessment. So um, you can um, take these, um, these tools uh, so you can revise them and have them as a toolkit. And um, I don't know if there is any other questions or doubts or interventions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know the microphone. Okay, um, just want to clear up something that we don't leave with the wrong information. <coughs> the whole electric vehicles, right, conversion here, um, is based on hydrogen. It's no charging, it's not lithium. It's just like you go to the gas station, fill up your tank, and you leave. Now, the vehicle going to convert the hydrogen into electricity. And is actually, let's say, stabilize, stabilization and increase grid resilience. So basically, it's not like the lithium, it's just like you're putting gas in your car and you're leaving. So that's all I wanted to clear up. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Gepesh, you want to make some um, closing words? Uh, well, in no more questions or comments? No? So, well, we hope that this session has been useful for you and that we know that some of the stuff that we have been explaining is easy and other part of what we have been explaining not so easy, but we wanted to make it easy. on the identification of barriers uh, for the private sector involvement in climate change and in particularly we will be working on uh, designing an action plan in order to overcome these barriers. So we will start with some um, sessions about the findings no, that we have obtained in the, no, with, via interviews or literature and so on and after that the idea is to create together an action plan. So we will just provide you with some insights of what we have uh, seen out there. And then the idea is together to work on what has to be done no? and how we can do it and uh, 
try to define uh, the best uh, that we can, the, an action plan in order to overcome all these barriers and so that we can get the private sector really involved in, in climate action. So that's what we will do to, tomorrow. I think the timing is the same, no? So the session starts at 9 a.m. here. Uh, so thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Tell you, I don't know if, hold on, hold on. Okay, so we wanted to make sure you got home early. Even though we started late, we're able to catch up. And we recognize that doing an activity on theory of change could probably take a whole day. So if you notice, we pivoted. Well, not pivoted. We just continued with the um, environmental and social safeguards, which I am quite happy you've grasped the concepts quite comfortably. You're going to find that in trying to apply to any climate finance type uh, initiative, these things are really important. Environmental social safeguards and even by extension governance elements and gender. So some of you already know that. So I'm quite happy um, with the outputs of the working group. Um, so to support you, I, uh, we want to commit and give you our promise, we're still going to leave you with something a little bit of a toolkit which you should get later on this evening it just needs to be finessed but just kind of a guide to walk you through how to create a theory of change and tips and so on so you can use it individually or with your team and we've created a very nice short uh, what you call mnemonic which can help you remember Yes, it's a book. It's a book, so you don't have to complain to say you don't know how to do it. You can't complain. So it's giving you some real context, some simple, you know, someone asked me today, well, every time you look at theory of change, they're all different with images and so on. Okay, so yes, they're different. People have different ways of being creative to express. For persons who are not very creative. We have just a, a little tip, but maybe you can use a process flow diagram to represent it. So there's some examples in here. And um, yeah, pretty much it breaks it down. So you can think of lively penguins, inspire inquisitive astronauts vividly. And that way you will never forget how to do a theory of change basically, the different steps and so. So you'll get it this evening, and you'll have this as a toolkit, which you'll, you can use um, to develop your theory of change whenever a project requires it. You don't have to call and say, oh, I don't know how to do this. You have it at your fingertips, okay? So thank you very much. For those of you who came a little late, please, I need your autographs uh, so that we can uh, send this to uh, five C's. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank you for joining. Uh, you will be receiving all the presentations for today as well as for tomorrow in a Google uh, folder. So look out for that email. And again, for those of you who are allergic to something, just send me a quick email letting me know. I'm going to definitely email that menu I sent. So if there's any little modification, I know that we have a few vegans in the room, I'll make a little something for you. So just let me know. All right, thank you. And see you tomorrow. If you have any takeaways, questions, feel free to let us know. Thank you. <laughs>